welcoming you to this edition of Wiki Workshop. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and this going, it is going to take uh, some seconds. Um, Actually, I'm going to share my entire screen. Um, um, so the organizers of the workshop are Bob West from EPFL, Miriam Reddy and Emily Desai from Wikimedia Foundation and myself and Sri John Kumar from Georgia Tech. We have been working on organizing the workshop for you since uh, September of 2021. Uh, and we are super excited that finally the day is here and you're with us in Wiki Workshop. Thank you so much for joining us early, during, uh, early in the program. Um, we started Wiki Workshop in 2015 uh, in ICWSM, and since then we have been going in ICWSM and primarily uh, with the web conference uh, throughout the world. Um, we have uh, gone to different places. Uh, we have tried to build different communities and bring people together around the topic of research on the Wikimedia projects. Um, I think the main theme for Wiki Workshop as we look back has been that our focus has been to build and strengthen the free knowledge and um, Wikimedia research communities. Um, and the program that you will see today will also reflect that wish that we come together as a community, get to know each other and exchange ideas about how to improve the free knowledge and Wikimedia uh, projects. Um, for those of you who are new to the space of Wikimedia, I'll just say very briefly, uh, there are multiple uh, Wikimedia projects. Uh, Wikipedia is, of course, the one that uh, everyone in this room will know. There's Wikidata, uh, which is the knowledge base behind Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, which is the media repository, Wikisource, Wiktionary, and more, more projects. Our concern in this workshop is primarily to understand these projects better. How do people collaborate with one another on these projects? Um, and how we how can we reduce the barriers for um, increasing the knowledge on these projects and also easing the dissemination of knowledge on these projects? We have put together a program for today that we are very excited to share with you. And I'm going to walk you at a high level over the program for you to have a sense of what's going to happen in the next six and a half hours together. There are going to be plenty of opportunities for us as a community to get to know each other a little bit more. Um, there, is, uh, there are going to be specific uh, plans and programs for that. I encourage you to participate in them. These are all going to be optional. However, um, it is important uh, for us that you engage with them, particularly because we are in this online setup where we don't see each other in the room and it's easy to forget who's in the room and why are we here. Um, there, we're going to, in half an hour or so, start with the research sessions. So you're going to hear from the authors of 25 papers who have been accepted as part of Wiki Workshop, their presentations about their ongoing or completed research projects. And you will have plenty of opportunities to ask questions and participate in the debate around the research. Um, for those of you who are returning from last year, uh, Ugne is back uh, with live music um, and her beautiful voice. She's going to be with us throughout the workshop and you're going to hear the live music of her um, throughout the day. We have uh, similar again to last year, we are organizing a panel this year. The panel moderator is Eric Muller and the topic of the panel is the Sopan People Blackout of the 2012. Um, the panel is going to reflect on the decade anniversary of SOPA and is going to attempt to help us understand how we can counter legislation that threaten internet freedom. We're going to have the Wikimedia Research uh, Award of the Year session where the researchers for the recipients of the award will join us and we're going to have a special guest who's going to present the awards to the researchers. And our keynote speaker is Larry Lessig. Larry is going to join us and he's going to talk with us about how can the internet be so good at and so bad, the lessons that we, may, uh, we should learn from Wikipedia. Um, I'm going to pass the mic now to Emily, who is going to walk us through the orientation. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a few logistics to go through before we get started. Um, so first, we want to recognize the great diversity that we have among the presenters and attendees today. 
so 80% of the attendees report a non-English language as their native language. And collectively, we speak 49 different languages as our mother tongues. So bearing this in mind, um, think about how you interact with others today. So be patient and welcoming toward each other. And we ask that you try to slow down when you speak. 33% of the attendees identify as women, non-binary, or genderqueer. So please be aware and actively work to help everyone feel included throughout the workshop. 62% of the attendees are attending for the first time. And so if you're a Wiki Workshop veteran, we ask that you please help newcomers feel included. And 31% of the attendees are students. So we're very excited to welcome the next generation of researchers to the workshop. And if you're a more senior member of the community, please keep an eye out for students. So traditionally Wiki Workshop is a research focused workshop. However, over the years, we've expanded the audience from only researchers to also include engineers, practitioners, policymakers volunteer editors, and staff from free knowledge organizations. So this year, 33% of our attendees uh, identify as non-researchers. 22% of attendees uh, are volunteers or organizers. And these individuals have really critical on the ground knowledge of the projects. So we're very excited to welcome these uh, groups with us today as they help us to increase the diversity of perspectives in our conversations. And 18% of our attendees come from Wikimedia organizations and affiliates. So they may be staff members of affiliate organizations or staff members of the foundation. What do we want to achieve? Why are we here today? Uh, I got really energized reading all the reasons why um, you all wanted to be here today. And here's kind of some high level themes that emerged. Um, so we're here to learn about the Wikimedia projects and research on or about them. We're here to learn about the Wikimedia movement, uh, different career paths in data science or machine learning, and how to apply uh, these themes to real world applications. Uh, we're here to present research. We're here to interact with the community and network. We're here to get research support as an editor, contributor, or educator. We're here to exchange ideas, start new collaborations, and most of all, have fun. So we'll be meeting today in this Zoom room. Um, we do encourage that you turn your camera on if you're able to and feel comfortable doing so, so that you can connect with others. We invite you to send messages in the chat to interact with each other. And you're welcome to use the reactions feature. And if you've never used it before, this is a great time to try it out. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, you'll see a little smiley face with a plus sign. So if you hit that, you can clap, you can raise your hand, you can give a thumbs up. Um, so this is a really great way to um, affirm and celebrate each other as we present and discuss today. And as a note, this virtual room will be recorded throughout the day and the presentations will be shared on the Wikimedia Foundation YouTube channel, as well as on the Wiki Workshop website. If you have any questions of the presenters or any technical questions, um, we do encourage you to seek help. Um, so that throughout the workshop, you can type your questions in the chat. During the breaks, you're welcome to unmute yourself and use your voice to answer or to ask questions. Uh, if your question is for the organizers, you can direct it to us by mentioning organizers in your message or question. And you'll see that uh, the four of us who are co-organizing this event, we all have organizer listed in front of our Zoom names. So you should be able to find us pretty easily. As far as question and answer sessions go for the presenters today, um, we do have dedicated time for these. And so our moderators throughout the day will let you know when question and answer sessions will be taking place. And you have two options for asking questions. Uh, you can type them in the chat and we'll also be sharing a collaborative notes document where you can also uh, list your questions or comments. And the moderators for the sessions will be asking questions on your behalf. And this is to keep us on our time schedule for the day. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand either by um, typing in the chat um, or using the Zoom feature, the reactions feature. Um, and you can ask your question when it's your turn. 
And just to bear in mind, um, we're here to build a community. Um, so we do ask that you follow the Wikimedia friendly space policy, uh, that you operate and interact based on humility and respect throughout the workshop. Take breaks when you need to, make sure you have a good time. And if you need help, um, again, please feel free to reach out. Um, you can email the organizers at wikiworkshop at googlegroups.com. You're also welcome to uh, message one of us in the chat. And please feel free to tweet or share your experiences on LinkedIn. Um, we ask that you use the hashtags wikiworkshop2022 or the web conference. Um, you can also mention us on Twitter at wikiworkshop. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had lots of fun in the breakout rooms. It's one of my favorite time of the Wiki Workshop, so I really hope you enjoy that. Uh, so I'm very happy to start the first session of our research program today. Before I start, I want to take well, 20 seconds to really um, celebrate this amazing community. So every year, we see the number of contributions to this workshop growing, and the authors put lots of love in, the, in their papers that our reviewers um, really do a wonderful job. So I am very pleased to celebrate how amazing the com this community is. So thank you everyone for being here, for contributing to this workshop as a reviewer, author, a participant, you're making this uh, workshop enjoyable for everyone. So thank you very much. So again, uh, I thought last year we had a record number of submissions, but this year we broke that record again. So um, we had more than uh, uh, 31 submissions. And um, we, out of these submissions, we accepted 25 papers to this workshop. Uh, since we have so many uh, papers now, we partitioned this into two sessions. You will hear three live presentations of about uh, seven minutes. Um, and then for the live presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask one question live uh, we will have chairs that will deal with uh, sorry um, moderators q a moderators that will deal with uh, uh, questions in the queue um and then you will uh, you will see in between seven and nine spotlight presentations in uh, the in a form of beautiful videos that our authors sent us um uh, again, as I said, if you have questions for our authors, either the live presentations or the video presentations, please put them in the chat or in the notes doc. And in, if we don't have time to ask them during this session, the poster session chairs will ask them to the authors during the, during the poster sessions. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. If we don't have room for you now, we will take, we will, make sure that your questions are um, uh, relied to the authors. Um, there is a detailed papers schedule for this uh, for today. Um, I, if you want to see it, I, I can't put the link in the chat, but I will do it as soon as I close this um, uh, slide deck. I Before I uh, leave the stage to our authors, I really want to thank again everyone for being part of this. Uh, all, authors and reviewers, PC members who gave them their love to this research program. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there's lots of high quality research that you will see in the next couple of hours. So without further ado, further ado I am going to start with the first session of oral presentations. Um, please refer to Tiziano for um, uh, questions if I'm not wrong. Um, and the first presenter who I invite on stage to share the screen is Karina Nugrianu, who is- Hi. Hi, good. Hi, Karina. Uh, please, I am going to stop sharing. You can share the screen while, uh, while I introduce you. Um, you are going to talk about rows from many sources, how to enrich row completions from Wikidata with a pre-trained language model. Karina, the floor is yours. Awesome. I hope you can see my screen and hear me. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Okay, we're good to go. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our first talk, which is Rows from Many Sources and Reaching Row Completions from Wikidata with a pre-trained language model. You were romantic. Oh, sorry. Uh, I am Karina, and I will be presenting this work on behalf of our collaborators, Alp, Jack, Shang, Danny, Andy, and Chinyu. So we are part of Microsoft Research and our common research interest is tabular data and in particular, how we can infuse tabular data with knowledge. Okay, so 
Say that you want to create a table about rap artists and your favorite friend sent you a snippet uh, about this subject. The goal of our project is to automatically extend tables like these such that users can build upon complete data and conduct meaningful analysis. So to be able to add a row about Kendrick Lamar, we need to do a few things. So first, we need to link the table so we know what the columns and cells represent, which is known as table interpretation. Then we need to be able to add new subjects, such as uh, Kendrick Lamar, which is called subject suggestion. And then we have to fill in the remainder of the row, which is called gap filling. So throughout this talk, we will show you output from our pipeline, which to our knowledge is the first one that targets this task, row completion, end to end. And also, we, I think we are the first ones to target Wikidata instead of DDPD or Freebase. So we have been dealing with different challenges uh, compared to our community. So at the end of table interpretation, uh, we can link all the entities in the first column to Wikidata. We can detect their join type, which is human, and we can figure out that the second column represents pseudonyms and the third column dates of birth. So unfortunately, we have no idea what column B represents at this stage. And for this work, we basically use our prior system with minor tweaks. Okay, so in order to suggest Kendrick Lamar, we first end up generating loads of potential candidates and then we rank them. So for Kendrick Lamar is a top suggestion produced by our pipeline. And then we generate candidates from two sources. So first we make use of empty representations from an embedding space trained on Wikidata triples. And this is called PyTorch BigGraph or PBG in short, that basically puts similar entities close to each other in distance wise. And it turns out that this method alone is awesome. It's really reliable, but we want to improve recall further. So basically this method doesn't give you all the candidates you want. And for that, we basically end up sourcing candidates using GPT-3's intrinsic knowledge. So GPT-3 is a language model, it's a fairly popular one and we wanted to try it out in this project. So in order to do this, we first identify properties to build a rich prompt. So we have to prompt the language model and ask it to continue our statement. Uh, so we create example sentences from each row in the original table or a subset of rows. So in this case, we would say something like, Kanye West has pseudonym easy and has date of birth 1977. Marshall matters and we continue. And then GPT-3 offers you a sentence about Kendrick Lamar. But this method is not, um, you know, it's not foolproof and we have some issues. So first sourcing from PBG is computationally expensive. Um, so we need to come up with a way to limit the search space like property sharding. Uh, basically the list of entities we retrieve can be incomplete because some entities might be triple poor or they don't get embedded optimally. So in this case, we need to come up with something else because the things that you actually want are far away in the graph when they got embedded. On the other hand, we found that GPT-3 on its own has high variability, which makes it quite unreliable, which is not good enough for our purposes. So to make it more consistent, we can lower the temperature of the language model, but that's significant recall, which is the whole point. So what we did was to basically combine generations from PBG and GPT-3 uh, to create basically features from these two spaces and then use a ranker. Uh, so we basically explored the wide range of rankers and with various complexities, but we found that for these purposes, uh, things like VAE based rankers are too rich and things that are simple like XGBOL are quite good. Uh, so they are both computationally efficient and have good results. Uh, this kind of led us to get a boost of over 10% for prior art when we looked at average recall among generations. Okay, right. So now we have Kendrick Lamar as a candidate. We want to basically be able to add its properties. So for gap filling, we first attempt to retrieve the property value directly because Wikidata is very reliable. And here we can retrieve basically the values in column B and column C because we have identified there about its pseudonym and its date of birth. And these both exist in, the, in Wikidata but we don't know what column D represents. So what we do is we basically built an iteration that guides GPT-3 to source the value we're keen on. So in this case, it looks something like A is to B, C is to blank, and now GPT-3 fills in the blank. 
In this case, you'll be something like Marshall Matters is to, Andrew, is to New York, as Andrew Young is to Detroit, as Kendrick Lamar is to, and actually GPT-3 fills in Glendale. So now we have this approach. Uh, we use this approach in two cases. When we cannot identify the property in the table, be it because our linker is not good enough, or because there's no property in Wikidata, like in this case, there's no property it had concert in, or in the case where the property value is missing from Wikidata. Uh, but even though our prompt gets us a completion, they are not necessarily trustworthy, and they're definitely not trustworthy enough to show to a user. So even though our, um, so what we do is that basically we try and link back the completion to a trusted web source, like Wikipedia or news articles, and we do so by first extracting a loose context from the current rows uh, by looking at web sources that say contain Eminem in New York, Dr. Dre in Atlanta. And we end up finding that it's basically something about concerts. And then we look for a source that contains Kendrick Lamar and Glendale. And if the context is similar enough uh, to the loose context we previously found, AKA it's about recent concerts, we can state that it's likely a match. And also we can basically pinpoint the source that we think that GPT-3 learned from. So using this approach led to a whopping 15% recall improvement over prior art and a significant reduction in hallucinations. So basically we managed to block out the things GPT-3 hallucinated like random years or random events. Um, so yeah, this is what we did in our project uh, for this workshop. And uh, please reach out with any question and thank you for listening. Andy Gordon and I are in the audience. Uh, so please address either one of us with any questions you might have. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, one question. So first of all, thank you for the presentation. There's one question from audience uh, about uh, uh, possible biases uh, that can be introduced by GP3. That is a known issue. Yes, uh, so we have that problem. We have actually done a bit of work on it. Um, we were trying to look for this. Um, it turns out it's a hard problem. And one, one is because it's kind of depends on what it learned. So for instance, we use GPT-3 heavily. If we use it for gap filling, that should not introduce biases because you're just filling in the remaining properties. But when suggesting a, a subject that does highly bias it, we have found that is the case. So for instance, if there's a list of artists um, that uh, say rap artists, in this case, you would always, always show a male artist. Um, so, or someone who identifies as a male artist. Um, and in that case, that is a significant issue. Uh, and in that way, actually PBG as like going through the embedding space a lot better because if the Wikidata knowledge graph is unbiased, then that means that this will become less biased as well. So that's definitely something to take into account. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Miriam, do we have time or are we done? Unfortunately, um, I am so okay. sorry to cut this, but oh. we need to go to the next presenter. Okay, Just, there are uh, a lot of questions, so you will get Oh, great, later. great. So um, Karina, you'll have time to answer this question in the, in the post session. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, Puyu, you're next. You're, if you, Karina, if you could kindly stop sharing the screen so we can have Puyu Young okay. on you. stage. Puyu Young is going to present the paper with Giovanni Coravizza on a map of science of Wikipedia. This is going to be in the knowledge integrity poster session. Um, Puyu, I've seen you, I know you. Can you share your screen? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Please. Uh, can you see that? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Pui. Uh, I'm glad to be here to introduce our research, a map of science in Wikipedia with you. In recent decades, the rapid growth of internet adoption is offering opportunities for convenient and inexpensive access to scientific information. However, 
a clear understanding of the scientific sources support Wikipedia's contents remains elusive. So in this work, we are going to explore Wikipedia's role in the public understanding of science from the perspective of its scientific sources. We rely on an open data site of citations from Wikipedia and use network analysis to map the relationship between Wikipedia articles and the scientific journal articles. Here are our research questions. What scientific sources are cited from Wikipedia? And what will on Wikipedia emerge? What will on science emerge? Answering these questions is critical to inform the community work on improving Wikipedia by finding and filling knowledge gaps and bias. All the same guaranteeing the quality and diversity of the sources Wikipedia relies on. Our data contains 29 million uh, million citations from 6 million articles in Wikipedia English version, snapshotted in May 2020. You could find more details about this data site from this link. Before showing the result, I'd like to give a brief introduction of our network's approach. In this article, uh, we mainly use two networks, bibliographic coupling network and consultation network. Here, the first line represents Wikipedia articles and the second line is their citations. In bibliographic coupling network, if two Wikipedia articles cite the same citations, we create a link between these two articles. Similarly, in consultation network, if two scientific articles are cited by the same Wikipedia article, we make a connection between these two scientific articles. So, what scientific sources are cited from Wikipedia? In our data, we have 2.5 million journal articles and we plot a Sankey diagram to show the flow from Wikipedia articles to scientific discipline. Obviously, most citations go from STEM Wikipedia articles to biology and medicine. This flow confirms the importance of biological, med 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 medical and health science in Wikipedia where other topics are more evenly distributed uh, across fields of research. Now, let's see the network distribution. To understand Wikipedia from a science perspective, we use bibliographic coupling network and colored by its author's topics and the number of top 10 clusters in the network. Below, we also list top four wiki projects in the top three clusters. Combine these two plots. Firstly, uh, we could see the systematic importance of STEM, and then its geography. Secondly, biographies and history play an important role in connecting STEM to the rest of Wikipedia. Also, for the consultation network, we visualize it using the same layout and different coloring by major field of research. The results are consi consistent with what we previously discussed. The dominance of biology and medicine as the two top fields cited from Wikipedia. Because of the time, we just showed some main results here and you could also find more anal analysis in our paper. A limitation could be seen is that we only focus on Wikipedia English version and only for journal articles, and we use the snapshot data. And for now, we are going to do studies of open science and media sources in Wikipedia. If you have any interest, if you are interested in any parts, please feel free to contact us. And thanks for your listening. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, there is one question uh, about uh, um, if you experiment with, by, with removing uh, stubs or bot generated articles, because in some languages uh, uh, there can be a large uh, number of um, uh, consistent set of sources that are added by bots and that are uh, typically from the same uh, database. Did you look into it? Uh so you mean seeing different language version or um 
No, no there are some, you, you focus only on English, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you know if uh, uh, there is uh, any automatic uh, uh, creation of uh, references? Yeah, I can maybe say something about this. Yeah. Uh, Puyo, if you if if you don't mind. So the um, the data set that we use is published in another paper, and uh, um, and that includes also uh, quite a measure of automatically generated uh, citations. And actually, uh, those are. Uh, from a very preliminary investigation, which is not thorough and should happen in the future, I, I believe. Um, uh, these bots help a lot, uh, for example, by adding uh, identifiers to papers, which is very important to, to conduct the studies that we have done. Uh, but to go back to the question, uh, so yes, uh, the, this study includes automatically generated citations, and no, we haven't, uh, we haven't developed a study specifically on, on their impact. Thank you. Miriam, thank you. Yes, Titana, just because we're running a little bit late, let's do like we did with Karina. Anything else will be asked in the yeah. process session. And so, we go to the next presenter, um, Kartik. I've seen you before. So if you could kindly start sharing your screen. I'm going to introduce you. Yes, Kartik Madangna Gopal and James Covery are presenting Improving Linguistic Bias Detection in Wikipedia using cross domain adaptive pre training. Kartik, the floor is yours. Thanks, Miriam. Hello, everyone. I'm Kartik Madangna Gopal, PhD student with the Department of Computer Science, Texas AM University. Uh, today, I'm going to actually present our work on improving linguistic bias detections in Wikipedia using cross-domain adaptive pre-training approach. One of the key guiding principles of Wikipedia is neutral point of view, which requires all content to be written fairly, proportionately, and as far as possible without any editorial bias. But still editors may knowingly or unknowingly uh, create bias in their uh, articles. Maintaining a neutral point of view can be challenging for new contributors and experienced editors. So there are various types of bias that can be introduced in the objective treatment of facts. In this work, we concentrate on the bias that is introduced by the subject to language in presenting the information. Here are some examples of the biased statements we have identified in Wikipedia. Framing bias is an explicit form of bias that reveals the author's stance on a particular topic by the use of one-sided or subjective words. On the other hand, epistemological bias can be extremely difficult because it's a kind of an implicit or a subtle form of bias that tends to cast a doubt in the reader's mind. So the goal of this research is to accurately identify all these different types of language induced bias and help the editors in objectively present the facts. Several previous studies have proposed automatic systems to detect biased statements. All these efforts have mainly focused on either manually constructing bias lexicons or solely focused on Wikipedia itself as a training data. Most of these methods were able to detect uh, simple forms of framing and uh, missed majority of the epistemological biases. The inability of the lexicon based and syntax driven approaches to encrypt sentence semantics led to misclassifications of certain subtle and implicit forms of epistemological biases. Due to the change in the editor's writing style that we commonly see in Wikipedia and their behaviors over time, these methods were not able to sustain their performance over a long period of time. After analyzing the results of these methods, we identified majority of the misclassified biased statements in Wikipedia belong to language and literature, politics and government and sports. With an effort to build a robust bias classifier that can detect subtle forms of bias and also continue to perform well for a longer period of time, we devised a cross-domain pre-training approach. First, we, in order to expand our coverage for domain-independent expressions related to judgments, interpretations, we did a data augmentation by leveraging annotated data sets from other subjectivity-rich domains like politics and op opinions like news articles and product reviews and things like that. Additionally, we used deep transformer models like BERT that can capture language patterns related to common writing styles and expressions that is imposed in subject to views. In combinations of data augmentation and deep transformer models, 
enabled our classifier to detect biased statements by understanding the meaning of the statements in the context rather than using the keywords that is mentioned in, mentioned in it. Our training data set contains NPOV statements extracted from Wikipedia, edit histories, uh, news related biased statements extracted from MPQA corpus that contains statements expressing the, uh, the author's private states like beliefs, emotions, sentiments, and speculations. Also, we added the political ideology statements that are extracted from IBC corpus. To train our bias classifier, we leveraged a contextualized language model called Roberta that can efficiently encode the meaning of text into a vector form that is efficient for training a text classifier. Also, instead of directly fine tuning a Roberta classifier, we used an adaptive pre-training approach that led to a superior performance in detecting biased statements. In our cross-domain adaptive pre-training approach, we downloaded the Roberta Deep Transformer model that was already trained on large volumes of text extracted from e-books and news articles. Then we performed a continual pre-training to actually make the model more towards understanding the subjective language that's coming from other domains and things like that. The continual pre-training is to adapt our pre-trained model to subject to writing styles that is required for our study. Then we added a final layer to a continued pre-trained pre robot model and fine-tuned it to classify the biased statements using annotated bias corpus. To study the importance of our deep transformer model, we first trained the bias classifier only using Wikipedia corpus. The lexicon-based model had a better recall because it was plainly looking at for the keyword and classifying the statements as bias without understanding the meaning. But the transformer-based classifier had a better classification accuracy of 77%. This shows that the transformer-based models are powerful enough to learn domain-specific statements and structures that are relevant for detecting language-induced subject to bias. To demonstrate the value of our cross-domain tree training, we trained the best model in a previous experiment using three different combinations of cross-domain training corpus. The transformer model trained with all the data sets combined had a better performance of 89% accuracy, which is 19% improvement in accuracy than the baseline models. We learned that the performance of these cross-domain models depend on the amount of knowledge overlap that, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. The amount of knowledge overlap that had with the domains that we are actually trying to mix. These results show that the proposed approach detects biased statements in Wikipedia more accurately than existing state-of-the-art models by leveraging rich pre-trained language models and fine-tuned it with cross-domain training corpus. To understand the performance of a bias classifier, we also applied the same model on other domains apart from Wikipedia. And we observed 12% improvement in classification accuracy on the MPQ opinion corpus. And uh, interestingly, the performance of a model on the IBC, which is more on the political speech, did not go well because, again, depending on the geographies, the political speech changes because there are some immigration issues, tax related issues, low income families, and there are so much of uh, pre presumptive statements and political speeches that our model was not able to capture it. We're still continuing to improve our model to actually understand the meanings of these different noun phrases that are coming through these presumptive statements to improve our bias detection accuracy. I'm happy to discuss more in detail during our poster sessions. Please visit our virtual booth number one. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of questions that are uh, on uh, more or less the same topic, uh, uh, yeah, specifically about the uh, moving target nature of the problem. Uh, do you have some uh, example of uh, the changes in editor behavior or subjective writing in, uh, over time that can degrade the model and uh, why the cross-domain adaptive pre-train uh, should mitigate the problem? Yeah, uh, specifically, uh, it's a very good question. So uh, I have one specific example that I've actually seen. Uh, this is because I'm from the US, most of the things I'm looking into it from the US political speech point of view. So after this, uh, the, the storming of the US Capitol, so we kind of trained the model between uh, 2005 and 2015, and we took the model and tried to apply it on articles that came after 2015. What we have seen is our model is, uh, most of the previous models were not able to actually detect the change in the way, because most of the times, this is what is smart about the editors, once they see their article is actually flagged for the NPOV board, they start to tweak the model, their writing in a way 
that this diocese is getting more and more subtle, but it still exists. So our models need to actually learn over time. But the model we trained was able to actually consistently perform for the next six years of time. That is a good, that's, that's what kind of helped us to understand, is this model improving or not? Is it able to capture future writing style? And again, our data augmentation is moving towards that. If we try to use Wikipedia itself as a source to train our model, it won't come forward and it won't be able to detect future things. By incorporating data from political speeches outside of Wikipedia, product reviews and things like that, we were able to induce how a biased writing more will look like. So in future, if someone tries to get some of those writing style into it, we will be able to catch it. So that's, that's one of the main reasons why this model is able to do well. Okay, Miriam, I think uh, we can move on. Sorry, I didn't want to disrupt. I just wanted to get ready for the next bit. Thank you so much, uh, Tiziano um, and Kartik. I um, need to uh, move the session forward. Uh, so thank you so much for the three of you for the beautiful presentations. You'll have time to discuss during the post sessions. Um, I am going now to play about 16, 17 minutes video where you will see all the lighting talks for all the others, other papers in the section. session. I hope you enjoy it. And if you can't hear it, uh, the audio, please, can someone tell me, would be great. Enjoy. Hello, I am Bart Magnus. I work for MEMO and I will guide you through the main steps of using the public domain tool. It is a tool meant for cultural heritage organizations to define whether their collection items belong to the public domain and this tool automates that process. First of all, you need the QID of your organization. You need the CSV file containing an export of your data, containing typical information like type of objects, like the author, like birth date, death date, external identifiers. The more you have, the better, but none of them is, uh, is actually necessary to use the tool. Um, you upload that CSV to the system and then you get back, back another CSV uh, with suggestions of the data items corresponding to the uh, authors of your works. This is where the manual work needs to be done. You need to check whether the suggestions are correct. Correct suggestions just stay in the CSV. Those that are not correct should be deleted. Once that's finished, you upload the CSV again to the system. And you get back a CS an enriched CSV with data pulled from Wikidata. You see much more birth dates and death dates here, for example. You see uh, QIDs for each and every author. You also see the copyright status of each work, either public domain, um, copyright protected, or unknown. At the same time, data have been added to Wikidata as well, based on the collection data. For example, professions are being added, uh, birth dates, death dates, always um, while making reference to the to the source of these data. So this is it more or less. Um, please feel free to ask a question. Hello everyone and welcome to this session. I am Reda Van Khadra and this is a joint work with Anna Sandrati entitled Are Democratic User Groups More Inclusive? In this paper, we investigate a particular online community structure, Wikimedia user groups, and answer the question of democracy and its relation with inclusivity in these groups. The background of this research starts from us, being both co-founders of a national user group, having been strongly involved in the Wikipedia ecosystem and its governance. We have noticed several conflicts and discussions about the lack of inclusivity in user groups that could originate from an undemocratic context. Building on earlier research work from one of the co-authors, we wanted to understand if indeed democracy was the solution to obtain more inclusive user groups. From this work, we used a strong theoretical ground to define the different central elements and be able to conduct a thorough mapping and analysis. Our final findings show that there is no strong correlation between both concepts 
as democracy is not always the solution for the inclusivity challenges that were identified in certain Wikimedia user groups, and that inclusivity issues need to be addressed through other recommendations and means. To the best of our knowledge, this paper represents a first attempt to tackle governance-related issues in Wikimedia user groups. We believe that this work can lay good grounds to enable further research in the matter, but also on general questions related to digital democracy that are within the interest areas of the world. Further research can check other issues apart from inclusivity and other challenges related to volunteering, such as burnout. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Jean Dupuis, and with Adrien Guy and Julien Jacques, we're happy to present a modeling approach at the Wiki Workshop. Since the emergence of the World Wide Web, hyperlinks have become the backbones of the network, and Wikipedia is no exception. Actually, hyperlinks are pretty central in Wikipedia, as they allow users to perform horizontal reading, leading to a better contextualization of contents. Hyperlinks are written by contributors and take the following form. The left part we found the target document, and on the right part, the more of our own from the link. We will call this part the end goal. Our goal is the following starting with a document network consisting only of technical contributors and our links. We aim to build a model which can predict what and are more susceptible to carry an upper links toward a given document. In other words, we want to predict anchors between a pair of Wikipedia pages. This model may be used to by recommending hyperlinks during the redaction phase. It may also be beneficial for some readers as this system could insert contextual hyperlinks based on previously seen contents, acting like an assisting reading system. We call this model contextualized relational topic model. As the name implies, it's a topic model built to take into account the relation between documents. It models anchors by the conjunction of an attention mechanism which permits to better estimate the importance of each topic and the use of additional parameters, helping to learn a new hidden representation more fitted to the anchor prediction task. You can learn that in English, German, and Italian on an anchor prediction task, link prediction task, both with previous studies and give qualitative examples. Experiments show that beside being language agnostic and computationally right, our model gives good results in anchor prediction, both qualitatively and quantitatively. It seems to be also suitable for a link prediction task. Thank you for listening. We will be happy to discuss this work during the post session. The gender perspective in Wikipedia, a content and participation challenge. This work is done by four different professors of three different universities in, in Catalonia, Spain. I'm Nuri Ferran Ferrer, the corresponding author. Wikipedia is one of the most widely used information sources in the world. Although one of the guiding pillars of this digital platform is ensuring access to the diversity of human knowledge from a neutral point of view, there is a clear and persistent gender bias in terms of content about or contributed by women. The challenge is to include women as equal partners in the public sphere in which Wikipedia is developing a central role as the most used educational resource among students, professionals and many other profiles. In this paper, we introduce the gender perspective in the analysis of the gender gap in the content and participation of women in Wikipedia. While most students focus on one of the two dimensions in which the gender gap has been observed, we review both approaches to provide an overview of the available evidence. Firstly, we introduce how the gender gap is framed by the Wikimedia movement strategy. Then we evaluate the gender gap on content and participation, especially regarding editor practices. Finally, we provide some insights to broaden the discussion about the consequences of not addressing the gender gap in Wikipedia, and we provide some research topics that can support the generation of recommendations and guidelines for a community that needs both equity and diversity.
Hi, this is an overview of the work on utilizing language model props for knowledge graph repair. Knowledge graphs, as we all know, are an important asset for machine knowledge. Web scale knowledge graphs like Yago, Wikipedia, and Wikidata are constructed manually, semi automatically, and automatically. They contain billions of SPO triples, such as Paris is the capital of France. It is inevitable, however, that these large knowledge graphs contain wrong information for a variety of reasons. In this example, we see extractions of Wikipedia triples about the entity Jessica Mowick from her Wikipedia info box. While her field was successfully extracted, namely marine science, her alma mater was mistaken for the city where the university is located, causing an error in the knowledge graph. In this work, we propose fixing predefined wrong triples without losing information by replacing incorrect components of the triple by the correct ones. We do so using context augmented language model probing. We identify this context and measure its relevancy from the input KG itself. For example, to fix the triple about Alma Mater Montreal, one way of probing the language model is to simply mask the incorrect component in the triple and request an alternative. In this case, all the predictions are incorrect, especially that Jessica Moog is a long tail entity. Instead, we augment the probe with salient context about her from the knowledge graph itself, like her profession and country of origin. In this case, we obtain more accurate answers where the top prediction is actually correct. Please check the paper for more details about the methodology and systematic experiments on the Wikipedia and Wikidata. Thank you. Hi. Furthering automatic speech recognition or ASR, research and application is more relevant to uh, real world human computer interactions. People with disabilities and young and older people alike require the ability to listen to and speak to their computing devices. Foundation for ASR for languages with limited resources is human uh, speech data and is often absent or is not enough. So new speech data has to be open and affordable. Take the example of my own language, Odia. Despite being the official language of an Indian state with 45 million speakers, very little speech data is available under open licenses. Such issues are worse in languages with lesser resources and they hamper speech research and development. Using an open source and online web app uh, lingua libre, I could record up to um, or over 400 words in a day. I could expand the topics by constantly collecting words from the Odia Wikipedia, online news sites, uh, a science magazine, and a 1930s lexicon. By building a workflow, I could expand to a repository of speech recordings of um, 55,000 unique words in Odia, including over 5,000 words in the northern dialect of Balasori. These recordings are available under a public domain dedication and are perpetually free for anyone to use. Um, so my key learning, first, um, creating a word list containing unique words in a language is critical for any speech data project. Diversifying these topics, um, these words fall under by looking at uh, all available sources even, is even more critical. Second, um, think of ways to expand the diversity. Finding speakers of various uh, genders, sources containing various topics and words from different eras help a lot. Even though the first launch, like mine, might include only one speaker of a particular gender. Third, uh, document your process. That helps others. I've tried to document some such uh, resources under the ambit of the Open uh, Speaks project, uh, an open and multimedia documentation project that I had founded for low and medium resource languages. Fourth, uh, encourage speakers to record words of their dialects if such words exist. Dialects are often neglected due to lack of resources. Lastly, using an open license helps others build further research on your speech data. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Wojciech Mishkinonyowski, and I will briefly describe you the results of our recent research. As we know, information in Wikipedia should be based on reliable sources. But nowadays, there are over a billion websites on the internet and only a very small part of them are assessed by Wikipedia community in special pages. Moreover, the reliability of the same source in Wikipedia depends on a topic and language version. Additionally, the reliability assessment may change over time. The purpose of this study is to identify reliable sources on a specific topic, COVID-19 
pandemic. So we decided to find which of the sources are reliable for Wikipedia based on analysis of its content in different months. To do so, we search for references in Wikicode of the selected Wikipedia articles in each considered month. Some references were not placed directly into the code of the articles, so we also analyzed how the content of special templates changed in the selected period. To select Wikipedia articles on COVID-19 pandemic, we can use different approaches. For example, in Wikidata, we can find items on a specific topics based on statements. Then, we can find the titles of related Wikipedia articles. We also can use Wikipedia that extracts structured information from Wikipedia info boxes. After extraction of the URL addresses in references, we used the public suffix list to detect which level of domain indicate the source. In our recent study, we proposed 10 models related to popularity and reliability assessment of the source. We used some of them and also proposed a new one. This figure presents results of assessment of the web sources on COVID-19 pandemic in English Wikipedia in each month. We also analyzed the reliability trends in other languages. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. In this presentation, I will highlight the potential of Wikipedia knowledge graphs as job interview kits. Job interview is an important step in HR recruitment process, yet it's not standardized, especially in the computer science related fields. The problem, which includes scalability, gets more difficult in the age of globalization where applicants come from diverse backgrounds. We can argue that knowledge graphs such as Wikipedia can be used to build interactive interview kits with the objective of linking knowledge entities. Under the premise that knowledgeable navigation is shorter than randomly picked pauses. As I try to demonstrate with a simple example here, Alice was able to have an assessment of Bob's knowledge of the topic and also see his thought process. Bob, on the other hand, was able to demonstrate his prowess. Here I list some of the important future works and this concludes the presentation. Comments, suggestions, and feedbacks are gladly welcome. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, all authors, for these uh, videos. I believe we're going for a five minute break. Um, Emily, if you can confirm, I think there is a timer at some point. Don't go anywhere because there will be live music when you're back. So be sure that you are around in five minutes because we're going to have lots of fun. Thank you, everyone, for your videos and presentations, and you will have the opportunity to answer any questions in the post session. Thank you very much. And now we'll start with the paper, uh, with the second set of papers. So the first paper uh, is titled Going Down the Rabbit Hole, Characterizing the Long Tail of Wikipedia Reading Sessions, and the authors are Tiziano Picardi, Martin Gilrick, and Robert West. Okay, uh, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see you, we can hear you, Tiziano. Okay, perfect. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to present you a characterization of uh, Wikipedia uh, rabbit, rabbit hole behavior. I'm Tiziano Piccardi, PhD student at EPFL, and this work uh, is a result uh, of the collaboration with uh, Martin Garlack uh, of the Wikimedia Foundation and my advisor, Bob West. So imagine you are uh, you hear about a TV series called The Last Kingdom. 
you check uh, on uh, Wikipedia what is it about, and you see that uh, it's about Alfred the Great. So you are curious to start uh, uh, and you start to follow the links, uh, discovering that he fought the Vikings. Uh, the Vikings uh, that uh, created Vinland, a settlement in North America, and uh, where they used to make wine from berries, and so on, uh, going to fermentation, Neolithic, uh, ancient Egypt, and you end up uh, reading about the polytheism and the role of pharaohs. What just happened is called uh, uh, falling in a wiki rabbit hole, uh, being dragged by Wikipedia in a long session where you get lost and learn uh, about a diverse set of topics. The name is of, co of course a reference to the novel Alice in um, uh, Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, this is a behavior uh, uh, well known in popular culture. Uh, but uh, uh, what we know is uh, based only on uh, anecdotal reports. Uh, in this study, we characterize uh, these uh, wiki rabbit holes in a data-driven way by investigating the digital traces left on the server by the readers. To support our analysis, we collected one month of server logs uh, of the entire Wikipedia in English. In total, we collected more than 6.5 billion uh, page load events that we carefully uh, anonymized. And uh, thanks to the HTTP uh, referral field, we transformed these logs into navigation, uh, uh, navigation session uh, that connect sequential click of, of the same user. But how do we recognize uh, uh, rabbit holes uh, session? Um, there are multiple possibilities, uh, uh, but uh, in our analysis, uh, we consider as a fall in the rabbit hole when the depth of the session is at least 10 articles. By applying this rule, uh, we retain around 0.24% of all the original sessions. And as the title of the paper suggests, uh, uh, we are exploring uh, uh, the long tail of the navigation sessions. Let's see how, uh, let's see now some of the um, uh, properties of these uh, uh, long sessions. First, by looking at the most common uh, entry pages, uh, we notice that often people start uh, long uh, explorations from articles about election, television shows, uh, and historical dynasties. All these uh, articles have one thing in common. The info box has uh, navigational links, such as predecessor or successor, that are used uh, by readers to explore uh, all the articles of uh, a series. A second interesting property is that uh, when we look at the temporal dynamics, uh, we notice differences between day and night. In this plot, uh, we have the fraction of uh, rabbit hole session by time of the day, divided by device and uh, weekday and weekend. Uh, we notice that the fraction of rabbit hole uh, sessions is higher during the night, with an increase of almost two times from mobile. But what topics are associated with uh, rabbit hole sessions? So, uh, to answer this question, we use regression analysis. First, uh, we assign to the first article of, uh, the, of the first article of the session the topic vector obtained from ORES, the official uh, um, Wikipedia topic classifier. And then we assign the positive label to session with at least a depth of 10 articles and the negative one uh, to uh, all the others. Then by fitting a logistic regression, we uh, obtain the topics that are uh, mostly associated with falling in, um, in a wiki rabbit hole. The coefficient show uh, that the topics, uh, the topics like, such as libraries, uh, history, and entertainment uh, lead readers uh, um, uh, to longer sessions while articles about uh, STEM and medicine are more associated with brief interaction with Wikipedia. Finally, the next natural question is uh, how do uh, these sessions evolve uh, beyond uh, the first page? For example, do people uh, move semantically far from the first article when they navigate the content? Uh, to answer this question, uh, first uh, we projected all articles uh, in uh, a topic space uh, obtained from ORES. We basically use uh, the topic vector as uh, the article position in this space. And then for each article, uh, starting a session, uh, like a great triangle in, uh, in this case, uh, we look at the evolution of the trajectory in this space. To have an null model to compare with the human navigation, 
uh, we uh, created a random worker that navigates Wikipedia by picking a random link available on the page. And for each trajectory, we run the random worker starting from the same document and for the same number of steps. And finally, we compute the uh, mean uh, square displacement that is used in physics uh, to measure the dispersion of particles from the starting position. It is basically the um, average of the square distances. With this metric, we can uh, uh, plot the diffusion uh, of the random trajectory in the semantic space. Each line uh, is in this plot is the average of the displacement of the trajectories of a given length. When we add the human uh, generated trajectories, uh, we observe an important property. They don't converge to a random location. Um, this is uh, important because it means that the readers stay in the semantic neighborhood of the first page, um, even for lo long session. So on, on average, uh, in a wiki rabbit hole, uh, readers get lost, but in a set of consistent topics. So in conclusion, um, we learned that uh, wiki, um, wiki rabbit hole session are uh, affected by the structure of the page, uh, are more frequent at night. Uh, they start uh, uh, more frequently from articles about entertainment. And on average, they don't lead the readers to a complete random page. Thank you for attention. I'm happy to answer your question. Awesome. That's time for one question. Yeah. Thank you, Tiziana. There are many great questions, so I'm sure you will answer later. To pick one, here uh, in this work and in this presentation, you focus on the long uh, sequences. But uh, how might navigation in such rabbit hole sessions compare to different navigation paths and different navigation strategies that one might see either in uh, games and artificial scenarios or in uh, real um, uh, navigation in the wild? So uh, this is uh, this work is a follow up of mm -hmm. another paper where we um, investigated more broadly uh, the navigation and um, we also uh, compare with um, um, the session generated by games and there is a the, an important difference that is uh, in, uh, in games uh, um, there is a clear definition of success so you know exactly where the user uh, was going. And uh, uh, so you explore how the user navigate uh, this network to find exactly uh, what is the goal. In natural uh, navigation is, uh, is very different. Uh, uh, you don't see this kind of uh, going uh, to a hub, meaning a page uh, that is generic uh, because um, you are uh, going to a central node to uh, find the destination page, but is, uh, in, uh, in average, uh, a lot shorter. Um, people attend, uh, for example, 78% uh, 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 of the sessions are composed by a single page load. So it's a fact check and then a daily Wikipedia. And then uh, uh, the exploration is different. It's not, um, it, it, they tend to go to the periphery of the network. So they enter in very popular pages from a search and then they diverge to a periphery. And then many other uh, differences, but uh, mm -hmm. there is a full paper uh, about that. Awesome. Thank you, Tiziano. We'll move on to the next presentation by Nicole Schwitter. And the title of the talk is Offline Meetups of German Wikipedians Boosting or Breaking Activity. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the nice presentation before. Um, so I will dive right in. What I'm presenting today is a part of my PhD thesis that is still a work in progress. And in my PhD, I research, well, Wikipedia, and I particularly focus on the people behind it, on the people that collaborate together to write this online encyclopedia. Now, I'm less focused on the online component, but I focus more on the other side, the offline side. So whenever people, whenever Wikipedians go out in the real world and put on their nice t-shirts and meet and face to face to get a face behind their usernames. Those informal meetups can come in all shapes and sizes from the from drinking 
meeting up in a pub and drinking a beer together or going on a hiking trips or organized barbecues or also be more work related in the terms of like open editing events. So those offline meetups are what, what I'm interested in in my PhD and I'm looking at how offline meetups influence online behavior. And today I'm focusing on one specific domain of online behavior. So I'm looking at how offline meetups influence online contributing behavior, so editing on Wikipedia. To answer that question, I look at the German Wikipedia from 2001 up to 2020. And on one hand, I have contributing behavior that I take from the data dumps where I look at the metadata. So I know who edited what, when, and I look at meeting data. Now meeting data is less, is not process generated. So it comes less structured, but it's still available because meetings are organized on the platform. So my goal was to scrape all organizational pages. Um, those pages kind of look like the screenshot on the right. Um, so you have a list of attendees and list of apologies and also minutes recorded. So my goal was to scrape all um, meetups organized on the German Wikipedia in that time frame. I ended up with over 4,400 meetings that took place in that time frame. Most of them, well, 99% taking being organized in the German speaking area, but 1% did um, take part globally in 20 different countries. So far to the descriptives. Now my question for today was is to identify the cause and effects of meetings. So I'm interested in whether those attendees with their t-shirts edit any different than um, a comparable group that did not take part in meetings. So what I want to do is I want to compare the, the on the right, the meetup attendees, the treatment group to a control group of non-attendees. So for each of my attendees, I selected one similar twin, similarity being defined as being similar in tenure and past activity, and then I can compare them. So my control group on the left and my treatment group on the right are similar up to the point of the meetup. And now I want to compare their behavior after the meetup. So I have a quasi-experimental setup and I can use a difference in differences design. So that means that I want to compare the changes before and after the meetup um, across the actual attendees, the treatment group, and the corresponding um, twins, the control group. In this presentation, I look at the long-term change. So I look at one year before the meetup versus one year after the meetup. In the paper, I also look at shorter-term changes. And I break the process into two separate parts. So first, I look at meetup at, I look at users which have not made an edit in the year before the meetup, and then look at did they make an edit after the meetup, yes or no. And I look at users which have made an edit in the year before the meetup and look at the change in the number of edits. So I have either did people that not edit before edit after the meetup, and if yes, to what extent did they um, change their editing behavior. Um, so now on the left, um, I look at this binary decision. So people did not edit before. And now the intercept is the baseline probability. And what we find, what I find is that 6% of people that did not make an edit in the year before um, do make an edit in the year after. So there's a 6% probability to start editing in the year after if you didn't edit before. However, if you're in the treatment group, meaning you actually attended a meetup, um, your probability is 25% higher. So if you actually attended a meetup, your likelihood to start editing is at 31%. If we look at the extent, we find a negative intercept. Um, what that means is that people make on average 12 edits less in the year after than in the year before a meetup, at least if they are in the control group. If they are in the treatment group, meaning they actually did attend this meetup, they only make about four edits less. So there's a negative trend, but it's much less pronounced in the treatment group than in the control group. So to summarize, what I find is that meetups have a positive effect on Wikipedia. 
um, users that do attend the meetup are much more likely to start contributing again after the meetup if they have not been editing articles before. And while it is not the case that users increase their contributions after a meetup in comparison to before the meetup, the reduction in contribution is less than a reduction in a comparable control group. And if you want more details um, about methods and more detailed analysis and directions for future research, please also look at the paper and come to the poster session. That's it, and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Nicole, for the great presentation. Um, one question is, um, how did you, oh, oops, I missed it. Um, do you also have any data outside of the German Wikipedia? And then uh, also thinking about uh, next steps uh, in your research, uh, what are the next steps that you're planning to do? And also if you can, um, also do active experiments and do some community campaigns. Uh, what would be ideal experiments that you could envision? Thank you. So many questions. Um, to start with the first one about language versions, I'm only, seeing, only focusing on the German one. Um, scraping all meetups did take me about one year. So um, there's just, there are many meetups and many pages to read. So it just does take a lot of time. Um, especially going to larger language versions. I did look at the uh, Alemannic Wikipedia as well, but I didn't really analyze it and used it mostly as a toy example. Um, I did forget the other questions. One was about- was just about the next steps. <laughs> our next steps. Um, so yeah, in my PhD in general, I'm also looking at how online behavior about offline meetups influencing um, elections and norm, so reverts. And so I'm currently working on that. Okay, thank you. There are a lot of questions. So I'm sure you'll have there, time. So. There are several questions for you, Nicole, which I'm sure uh, people will ask you in your uh, in your poster session. Uh, thanks, uh, Christina. We'll move on to the third and the final full talk uh, in this session. And the title of the paper is The Role of Online Attention in the Supply of Disinformation in Wikipedia. And the authors are Anist Eleviari and Giovanni Luca Giampaglia. So over to you, Anas. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, we can see you. Okay, awesome. So my name is Anis and I'm a PG student at the University of South Florida. And today I'm presenting our paper on online attention and disinformation on Wikipedia. I have worked on this research alongside my supervisor, Dr. Giovanni Champagne. So um, there exist many potential threats to Wikipedia's knowledge integrity. One of these threats is the creation of hoax articles, which are fake or fictitious entries that were deliberately created. For example, this is a hoax article that was created about a fake Australian god and lasted around 10 years without getting caught. Vandalism is another common threat to Wikipedia's knowledge integrity. However, hoaxes are different from vandalism in the sense that vandalism defaces existing articles, while Wikipedia, while hoaxes are completely new um, entries. Vandalism attacks can take the form of textual insults, humor, page planking, as shown by this example. In a research conducted by Dr. Kumar and colleagues, amongst them is Dr. Robert West, um, they showed that 92% of hoaxes get detected within the first day, with one in 100 hoaxes survive for more than a year. So people's behavior online is influenced by both endogenous and exogenous factors. And these factors in turn shape how we produce and consume information on the web. And in a study conducted previously by Dr. Champalia and uh, colleagues, they studied the creation of non-hoax articles on Wikipedia. And they showed that there is a sudden spike of attention right after the creation of Hurricane Sandy entry on Wikipedia, which means there was a need, there was a demand for an article to be created about that uh, topic. They then went on to show that the demand drives the supply of information for non-hoax articles. And um, the unresolved question is, what drives the creation of hoaxes on Wikipedia? And to get a step closer into answering that question, we try to see whether online attention in the form of traffic to Wikipedia toward a topic 
increase the likelihood of disinformation in the form of hoax articles being created about it. And to do so, we've collected a set of known hoaxes, which is 190 hoax articles that are kept within a page maintained by Wikipedia moderators. And these hoaxes are successful in the sense that they evaded detection for more than one month or discussed by media sources. This plot shows how many hoaxes were created for each year. And as we can see, between 2005 and 2007, um, that's where the majority of hoaxes were created in that set. And that, um, and that is parallel with Wikipedia's known peak of activity during that time. And in 2008, we see a decline, and that's because the MPP process, Wikipedia's patrolling process, started in November 2007. And um, we've mentioned the word topic before. A topic in our research, we define it as the non-hoax non outlinks, which is the pages that are linked within a hoax article. And we are studying the traffic for that topic 14 days in a, over a 14-day observation window centered around creation day. So seven days before creation and seven days after creation. And for each hoax, we calculate the relative volume change, which is delta V over B with V of B representing the topic's median traffic seven days before, and V of A representing uh, seven days after for the topic's median traffic. And if that value is positive, if the, the, the relative volume change is positive, that means that the hoax accumulates more attention before creation than after. However, to affirm that claim that it is not unique to hoaxes, we have to establish a baseline to compare our relative volume to. And we collect what we call a cohort. And a cohort is defined as all the non hoax articles that were created on the same day as each hoax. So we have 190 hoaxes, 190 cohort for each hoax. And uh, this cohort was collected after resolving redirects. And this plot shows that the inclusion of redirects not only inflates the cohort size, but also can skew the, the traffic analysis that we do, which is getting the values of delta V over V. And, um, and inspired by the work of Dr. Kumar and colleagues, we studied the appearance features to understand how hoaxes differ from cohorts. We're not gonna get into detail about all of the appearance features, but we're gonna point out one feature, which is uh, the wiki link density represents by how many, um, how many outlinks exist within a page per 100 words. This graph simply shows the z-scores of that appearance feature. If the z-score is positive, that means that the hoax article tends to, tends to have more density than um, the cohort. And if the z-score is negative, it's the opposite. And uh, we can see in this graph that it's nicely centered around a zero, which means that um, we can eliminate any confounding factors that can exist from our analysis due to different linking patterns, such that hoaxes and cohorts have similar linking patterns. So that's why it's um, an apples to apples um, kind of situation when we compare hoaxes to cohorts. And um, this graph shows just a sample distribution of delta V over V for one hoax. The turquoise bars shows the, the, the distribution of the delta V over V for the cohort. And um, the red line shows the delta V over V for the hoax. And the, the black dashed lines shows the average for the turquoise distribution. And um, if the value of the hoax, if the red line is to the right of the, of the black line, that means that the hoax compared to its cohort tends to accumulate attention before its creation than after. And to better understand if this applies to all of the hoax articles within our data set, we calculate the difference. The difference is simply the, the subtraction of these two lines. And if this difference is positive, that means it affirms the case that attention is accumulated before creation for the hoax. And um, this shows the distribution of the 190 D values that we got. And um, the mean in this case is positive, which means in most of the, of, the, of the difference values, hoaxes tend to accumulate more attention before creation. And we constructed the 95% confidence interval using bootstrapping. And we can see the sample mean falls within the 95% confidence interval. And to conclude, um, hoaxes tend to have more traffic accumulated before their creation than after when compared to their cohorts. And this is consistent with a model in which the supply of false and misleading information is driven um, by attention. And probably the most important conclusion of all is do, do not create hoaxes. Like if, you, if, if there's only one point you get from this presentation is please do not create hoaxes. And uh, if you would like to replicate our plots or generate our data, this is the GitHub link. And uh, thank you all, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions.
Thank you, Anis, for the great presentation. Um, one question related to the selection on the media coverage. So mm -hmm. um, could the discussion by media sources introduce a bias because there might be some very short-lived hoaxes that get picked up by some media. So did you check the characteristics of, uh, of the hoaxes and the, the duration of the coverage? Um, not, not individually, but all of these hoaxes are successful uh, in the sense that they were discussed. Not all of them are discussed, but some of them are discussed. But we didn't go individually into checking whether each one of these hoaxes are discussed by um, by media sources. However, in, in our future consideration is to expand this to not only successful hoaxes um, and um, in non-English Wikipedia entries as well. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Anes. Uh, now we move on to the lightning talks. This is the second round of those. And again, please uh, put your questions for these lightning talks. Uh, in the Google Doc. We won't have time to take questions immediately afterwards, but you'll use that during the poster session. So uh, Miriam, if you could please uh, start the lightning talks, please. Hi, my name is Nidia Hernandez. I am responsible of data processing in CAICIT CONICET, a research institution in Buenos Aires, Argentina. On this video, I will present the first steps of a study related to improving Wikipedia's references. Wikipedia allows to automatically generate citations from a URL using a citation generator. These automatic citations sometimes present errors, as you can see on the screen. Our research is part of web 2 sit a project that is developing a tool for improving the results of the citation generator for URLs. We want to evaluate the performance of the citation generator, comparing the citation that it produces for a URL with the correct form of the citation for that URL. To do this, first we need to find a set of correct citations having URLs and extract the metadata from them. We also have to obtain automatic citations for the same URL and measure the difference between the correct and the automatic citation. For the first step, finding a set of correct citations, we gather the corpus of 10,000 featured articles from English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish Wikipedias. We isolated all the citation templates from the Wikicode and we then extracted the information for a series of parameters, title, author, source, uh, um, date, and of course, URL. So if you're interested in our findings regarding these first steps, please take a look at our long abstract of the sites conference. And if you want to know more about the script and the following steps, visit our Jupyter notebook on pause and join us on the conversation of the Wiki Workshop. Thank you. In the last few years, major social media platforms like Twitter and Reddit have noted the phenomenon of ban evasion, a ban circumvention strategy that leads to temporarily disjoint operation of two accounts. To study online ban evasion, we have curated a data set of about 8,500 ban evasion pairs in Wikipedia where each pair comprises a banned malicious parent and a child that was created to evade the ban and continue malicious activities. We formulate the ban evasion lifecycle and address crucial early prediction, detection, and attribution tasks using machine learning models. Our models demonstrate an impressive ability to predict and detect ban evasion. Additionally, our data-driven analysis shows that there are similarities between parent and child accounts in terms of edited pages and vocabulary used. Interestingly, some ban evaders tend to hide by using fewer swear words and more objective language than their banned parents. Based on our research, we are working on a tool that would help Wikipedia moderators in evaluating suspected ban evasion. Here's a demo of the tool by Zen and Geo. Let's say we have two users with quite different usernames. The model informs us that these two users are a band evasion pair with a probability of 0.87. We want to understand why our model thinks that way. When we open the metadata dashboard, we can note that even though these two usernames don't seem similar, they are actually editing the same Wikipedia pages, such as 
Paul Rose, and Victor Davis. For a closer look, we analyzed the most similar sentences added by these two accounts and noticed that they both mentioned two people with the same last name who were born in the same location and were involved in rebellion groups. Our system also captures sentences that discuss burials and symmetries as similar. It also allows visualizations across other categories like vocabulary overlap, psycholinguistic attributes, and sentiment scores. Thank you, and please stop by our Wiki workshop poster and full presentation in the main conference. Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Healy. I'm a PhD candidate at Soap Labs at Monash University. Today, I'll be presenting this early stage joint research project titled Editing the Truth. In this project, we want to understand how and why governments may be interfering in Wikipedia. In particular, we're looking at the capacity of states to disseminate information in Wikipedia. And we're using government edit quality, in particular, the ability of government entities to adhere to the strict editing standards of Wikipedia to create a new measure of bureaucratic professionalism in the digital space before looking at the determinants of government editing behavior on Wikipedia. We start by creating a data set of 46,000 edits from 702 government entities in 83 countries. We create this data set using a database called DBIP, which has ownership information for the universe of internet protocol addresses. We create a tool to query each owner in the Google Knowledge Panel and extract an entity description for that owner. We then create a training data set of entity descriptions using the Wikidata taxonomy and classify each owner in the DBIP database as government or not government. Using our government IP dataset, we match this to anonymous Wikipedia edits in ORS compatible language versions of Wikipedia and use this vandalism detection tool ORS to measure the good intent of the government editor and whether or not the edit being made by the government entity damages the quality of the article. We find the percentage of high quality and low quality edits using this measure are a good measure of bureaucratic professionalism. In particular, that states with higher education, a greater proportion of female staff, and higher cybersecurity skill make higher quality edits on average. We then map the geolocation of each Wikipedia article being edited by the government. Here we see the map of government edits by United States government entities, and we use this to uncover the determinants of government edits. We look forward to discussing this with you more in the poster session. Hello everyone, nice to virtually meet you all. My name is Mikola and my colleague is Diego. And today I want to present our work, Wikifactline Semi-Automated for Checking Based on Wikipedia. Even though the full automation of the fact checking remains unreachable today, any tool that can support the fact checkers with their manual work can be quite useful. In this work, we concentrate on search for fact checking. We experiment with different manual search strategies that true claim label and the article's quality influence on the fact checking. We use the fever data set and process that for our needs, living on the supports and refutes labeled samples. Also, we actualize their article names. We use the rate of found items, the rate of correctly placed item on the first position to evaluate our results. According to our experiment, the uh, searching for the raw claim in the Wikipedia search gives the good results, but the enhancement of the strategy by extracting the name entities and looking for them um, shows the great increase in the metrics. Another finding was that using the Google search and uh, the raw claim as a query uh, gives the comparable good results. Another interesting discovery was that searching for sources to refute incorrect claims can be more complicated than looking for correct statement evidences. But the strategy with query modification uh, reduced that effect by searching for mentioned name entities instead of using the whole claim as a query. Also, we observed the article's quality um, got from WP10 model, and we found out that the distribution of articles of different quality differs on the different position in search. Also, we decided to build the initial pipeline for the ranking results to make the search more specific for fact checking using the quality information and um, learning to rank model that increased the recalled one in our case. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to answering all your questions and speaking with you and stand with Ukraine.
Hi, I'm Nathan DeBlenheis, and I'm excited to be here at the Wiki Workshop to present my research investigating how to measure Wikipedia article quality in one dimension by extending ORs with ordinal regression. This is from work that I presented at OpenSim last year. Article quality measurement is an important uh, topic and thing to do for Wikipedia community members to track knowledge gaps, as well as for academic researchers to study important topics like political polarization and collaboration. Uh, now, Wikipedia has wiki projects. The wiki projects have members, and the members do quality assessments that are really valuable that allow us to study article quality in a really good way. However, their assessments are uh, limited in that they happen irregularly in time. Articles can change between assessments, uh, and this leads to missing data. As a result, uh, researchers have used machine learning to predict uh, that missing data, the quality levels of articles that haven't just been assessed. The second limitation of the assessments is that they happen on a discrete scale. This is probably actually a good thing from the perspective of the people doing the assessments, but for statistical purposes, it's a little bit complicated uh, because we might want to measure more granular levels of quality. Uh, Hathaker and others building on his work have dealt with that by basically combining the output of the ORS model into a single score because the ORS model out actually outputs uh, different scores for each quality level. Uh, and this process of combining the scores depends on assuming that the Level, that the different quality levels are roughly evenly spaced from each other. But I think that that assumption is doubtful uh, because it might take like a lot more work to raise a good article to a feature status than uh, to raise a stub to a start level. Um, and so in this project, I'm relaxing that assumption by using uh, ordinal regression model to combine the weights instead of just uh, taking their sum. And doing this provides an improved uh, level of accuracy um, on realistic research data sets. Uh, and we can also infer the um, different spacing between the quality levels. So this chart shows on the vertical lines, like for different data sets, uh, the quality levels that we would, the different quality levels. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you soon. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kai Zhu. So today I want to share with you our research in progress. Can machine translation narrow knowledge gap across languages? So this is the very early stage work, so any of your comment, suggestion, and feedback uh, will be highly appreciated. So in this study, we want to investigate the role of machine translation in content production on Wikipedia and how it could help with the knowledge gap issue. So we leverage a niche experiment where Wiki uh, PDF integrate Google Translate into its in-house content translation tool in January 2019. So content translation is this tool developed by uh, Wikimedia Foundation to support its editor uh, create an initial translation draft of an uh, article from another language of uh, Wikipedia by translation. Right? So from January 2019, you can use Google Translate to translate articles. So we have a uh, set of research questions that we aim to answer. We don't have the answer for all of them yet, but this is kind of the goal. Okay. So the first question is about information exchange between different language editions of Wikipedia. The second question is about how uh, the behavior of editor will change the, the way and the way they collaborate with machine translation algorithm. The third is about the diffusion of locally relevant and culture-specific content. To have some preliminary results, first of all, uh, we just see such a clear trend after the integration of Google Translate in 2019. So there's a steady increase in number of articles created with content translation. Okay, so that's all the time I have. If you're interested, please reach out. Hi everyone, I'm Mar Miguel. I will give you an overview of this paper called Wikipedia Older or Teen, co-authored with Christian Consoni and David Laniato. Wikipedia is an undeniably successful project with an unprecedented number of online volunteers. However, researchers observed that the number of activators for the largest Wikipedia language editions started to decline in 2007. Years after those announcements, researchers and community activists still need to understand community growth. In this study, we inspected the temporal evolution of the number of activators, comparing the trends obtained for different language editions and performing clustering to identify in general patterns. We focused on the 50 largest language communities in number of activators in August 2021. 
to group communities exhibiting similar temporal patterns, we applied k-means clustering to the time series, and we use dynamic time warping to measure a similarity between the temporal sequences. We obtained these six clusters. Our results suggest that only half of them exhibit a pattern of decline and or explanation, while the others are still growing in the size of their editor communities. This represents a significant breakthrough given that it was widely assumed that communities were all in decline for not being able to maintain their number of activators, possibly because of a focus uh, on English Wikipedia on other language, large language editions. Uh, to talk more about this topic, uh, we'll see us in the Wiki Workshop. Thank you very much. This paper, The Digital Gender Disparity, is part of a larger Wikimedia research project titled Mapping Repositories on Gender and Sexuality in Indian Languages at CIS A2K. This research rise in continuum with earlier research done in the last decade at CIS A2K on gender gap in Wikimedia research projects. The gender gap and bias as noted in the existing scholarship lies in two forms. One is the participation gap and the editor composition, the second one being the nature of the content. This research focuses on the nature of the content that is produced on gender, sexuality and feminism in Indian languages. Thereby, this research lies in three major themes knowledge production on gender and sexuality, digital documentation of existing knowledge, and Indian languages. To understand the process of knowledge and content creation on gender, sexuality and feminism, through this research we have interacted with major stakeholders in the realm such as writers, translators, educators, artists, producing content within the capacity of individuals and organizations. Two major observations that have been made in this research are going to be presented here. We have learned from our respondents that the digital space is no less to the actual world. Socio-political ramifications that exist in the actual world are also reproduced in the digital space that hinder the process of knowledge production on gender, sexuality and feminism, which also leads to the lack of digital documentation of the existing knowledge on gender, sexuality and feminism. We have also learned that social media has evolved as a space for creation of knowledge and content and its dissemination, especially by individuals hailing from socio-economically marginalized sections. The second finding of this research was the importance of locating a critique. We have learned from all our respondents that the knowledge that they produce is very critical of how gender operates and they have been very consciously deploying an intersectional perspective while they are producing knowledge on gender, sexuality and feminism. Specific examples to this, as pointed out by our respondents, is the difficulty in translating conceptual vocabulary on gender and sexuality in Indian languages, the overemphasis of framing the feminist critique from the Western or the Anglo-centric perspective. It is also pointed out to us from our respondents that the Wikimedia projects should also include these critiques and work with a similar intersectional approach while they are producing knowledge and content on gender, sexuality and feminism. Thank you. This work is called Wikipedia and Gender, the deleted, the market and the unpolluted biographies, created by Professor Nuria Ferran Ferrer, Professor Julio Meneses and me, David Ramirez Ordonez. The gender bias in Wikipedia presents as a problem of three different kinds, editors, content, and readership. We focus on the gender content bias, specifically in the content creation and deletion process. We are working on English Wikipedia on biographies of scientists. The deleted, the market, and the unpolluted biographies. In this diagram, you can see different types of biographies after the evaluation process made by editors creating a spectrum, starting from the deleted biographies, those marked for lacking notability or reliable sources, and biographies without any mark or unpolluted biographies. We propose this methodology for the analysis of two corpus of data, biographies in the articles for deletion category 
and biographies tag to include reliable sources. In this way, we can cover in invisible biographies for those who are not administrators. We consider that in order to solve the gender bias within Wikipedia, we need to understand the logic of the evaluation of biographies regardless of the number of biographies created. If we don't take this into account, despite that more articles are created, the rate of deletion or tagging may still maintain the imbalance and the gap will continue to persist. Thanks for your attention. Please get in touch with us. Hello everyone, my name is Oktay Hassanzadeh. The work I'm presenting today is done as a part of a project at IBM Research with the goal of building an AI agent that could help with preparing for the future and helping the world plan for the so-called known unknowns. For the work we're presenting at this workshop, what we are exploring is whether we are able to build an event analysis and forecasting solution using the knowledge expressed in text and Wikipedia articles about past events and their consequences. I have a very simple example here to show the high-level idea. If we go back to January 8, 2020, we may be able to map the initial news articles covering the World Health Organization's announcement on a pneumonia outbreak with a known cause to relevant knowledge in Wikipedia, for example, the knowledge that SARS outbreak had similar events at the start, then we can look also for what SARS outbreak resulted in, use that to predict some of the consequences of the new outbreak. For example, the effect on tourism industry and then oil and gas prices, which also happened for COVID. The question is, will we be able to do this faster than analysts and at a scale? Here's a high-level architecture of the solution we are building using Wikipedia and Wikidata and in part Wikinews. At the core, there is a causal knowledge graph of events curated from existing event-related knowledge from Wikidata and then augmented by knowledge extraction from Wikipedia articles. In this solution, monitoring ongoing news is done through mapping news headlines to event concepts in the knowledge graph, and the analysis of the events is done through looking at past similar events and their causes and consequences as captured in the knowledge graph. As you can see on this example, Wikidata already has knowledge around major events and relations such as has cause or has effect, but of course it's far from complete. At the same time, there are many relations expressed in text in Wikipedia, even the first pa paragraph of the article, and what we do is automatically extracting such relations to augment the Wikidata-based knowledge graph. This is done primarily through a number of neural models for language understanding. If you come to our virtual session, I would love to go through some of the lessons learned so far and the work we can do with the Wiki community to address some of the challenges we have faced in this project. Good day and welcome at the presentation on considerations for our model on noun classes in Niger Congo B, also known as Banto languages in Wikidata. I am Maria Kate with the University of Cape Town and this is joint work with Langa Komalo from the Sadi Lab and Zola Maslaza from the University of Pretoria. The broader context is about the paucity of Wikipedia pages in the languages spoken in Sub-Saharan Africa. Abstract in Wikipedia might help speed it up in creating those pages, but it relies on Wikidata for lexicographic data, and it has very little of that for the NCP languages. The first key step is, is the noun class system, as it governs the rest of a sentence. So here is a summary table of those noun classes, and what kind of things can be found in each of those classes. For instance, class 1 in the singular pairs with 2 in the, for its plural for humans, whereas other animals go in noun class 9 and 10, respectively. These noun classes affect the sentence construction. Consider, for instance, the adjective tall and the verb eats, uh, which remain the same for English, whatever entity it applies to. But for the NCB languages, there are concords that depend on the noun classes of the noun in order to complete the adjective and the verb, as we can see here on the slide. And we set out to collect those requirements for a model, which are based on two premises, being linguistic soundness and bootstrapability to other on a resource languages. So here's a sampling of those 14 requirements. First, it would be Meinhof system, like shown in the previous table, uh, that is key since it's the only one that satisfies those two premises. It also includes translation aspect and various optional features. The list of requirements in the abstract may be challenging to implement fully, but we are nonetheless trying to design a comprehensive model that is extensible. A first concrete action for Wikidata would be to use Minos system to cover the very basics, which then also aligns with existing natural language generation functions. Any feedback on the requirements is welcome. Thank you for your attention.
Awesome. Uh, definitely the most musical workshop that you're ever going to attend. Thanks so much to all the presenters. Uh, I know that there, that was a lot of lightning talks, but you'll get a chance to talk to each of these authors, each of these presenters during the poster talk. But before that, we have an eight minute uh, break. And uh, I believe uh, during this time, get your coffees and then we'll come back for the poster session. Why don't I start again? 10 years ago in 2012, Wikipedia, together with many other websites, was purposefully made unavailable for one day. When trying to access Wikipedia that one day, you just saw a black screen with a disclaimer saying that Wikipedia was unavailable um, in order to raise awareness about two proposed US laws called SOPA and PIPA. If you don't know about SOPA and PIPA, um, then no worries. You will learn about it during this panel whose purpose is to look back at the events 10 years ago and to draw lessons from it for the future. And in fact, you have the best possible host for guiding us all through the panel. And I'm not talking about myself, of course, I'm talking about Eric, Eric Möller. Eric is a freelance journalist, a software developer, and an author. He has a long history with Wikimedia. He started to be involved in 2001. A little reminder, 2001 is the year that Wikipedia was founded. So he is an early adopter, a very early adopter. And uh, so back in 2001, Eric got involved as both an editor and as a developer of MediaWiki, the software that Wikipedia runs on. He also gave Wikinews its initial momentum. Later on, uh, he became deputy director of the Wikimedia Foundation, where he stayed until 2015. And now he's freelance. Most important in the context of this panel is that Eric was one of the persons at Wikimedia one of the key persons at Wikimedia during the blackout 10 years ago, which is why I said he's the best possible person to moderate the panel. And with that, Eric, over to you. Hey, uh, can folks hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, just to clarify, nowadays I'm uh, running engineering at uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, which is the uh, nonprofit that, um, uh, among other things, uh, manages the uh, secure uh, open source whistleblower platform and, of course, also advocates um, for uh, um, policies uh, that protect the free and open internet. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the, the introduction and also uh, the summary of what we're going to talk about. Um, we don't just want to talk about what happened 10 years ago. Um, but also um, what it means for uh, the moment we're in. Is uh, something like the success of the SOPA blackout repeatable uh, in the current moment, in the current technological and political environment, or is it not? Uh, and what legislative threats uh, are emerging uh, today? With me to have this discussion, we have Corey Doctorow, uh, who is the author of a, a vast bibliography of uh, fiction and nonfiction alike. As an author, Corey has consistently advocated against copyright maximalism, uh, even uh, while folks have pretended uh, to speak on his behalf uh, in favor of copyright maximalism. Um, he is the author of nonfiction works that are very much relevant uh, to this discussion, such as uh, how to destroy surveillance capitalism and coming up uh, later this year, choke point capitalism, how big tech and big content captured creative labor markets and how we win them back. Uh, he's also a special advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Welcome, Corey. And wow. uh, we have Tiffany, uh, Tiffany Cheng, uh, who is the uh, co-founder of uh, Fight for the Future. Um, without Fight for the Future, there would probably not have been a uh, super blackout. Uh, Fight for the Future was absolutely instrumental in helping organize uh, this grassroots campaign. Uh, she wrote and Tiffany wrote a, uh, an excellent analysis earlier this year, which I encourage you to check out. Uh, if someone could put a link to the chat, I, I would appreciate it. It's called uh, How the Sofa Blackout Happened on TechDirt. Um, so uh, take a look at that if you want to read a little bit more in, in detail than what we're going to be able to talk about uh, today. Uh, Tiffany was a uh, Shuttleworth and Ashoka Fellow at Fight for the Future. She's um, uh, helping run the A-Teams uh, initiative, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, here later today, as well as some of the ongoing um, campaigns at FTF. Welcome, Tiffany. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, we also have Mishi Chowdhury. Uh, Mishi is a technology lawyer, uh, legal director at the uh, Software Freedom Law Center, uh, defending software freedom and online rights in, uh, in the United States and in India. Uh, welcome, Mishi. It's so great to have you. 
Um, so yeah, let, let's jump right in. Um, we can assume that some folks in the audience were still fairly young when uh, the SOPA blackout happened. Uh, so I think it will be useful to just uh, start with uh, what was this legislation? Why was it such a big deal? Uh, why was it so important to mobilize uh, the free and open internet uh, against it? Um, I'm just going to actually kick it over here to Tiffany. Tiffany, do you want to talk a little bit about how this came uh, onto the radar for uh, Fight for the Future and why it was such a big deal? Sure. Uh, so there was this bill called SOPA, which had, by the time we looked at it, had gathered uh, around 90 co-sponsors. And it was the biggest piece of legislation uh, that... Um, Hollywood, MPAA, RIA um, had spent, they had spent the most money that they've ever spent on one piece of legislation. And it was slated to passage. And this bill, uh, SOPA, or is also known as PIPA, um, would have made it possible for, for alleged or potential copyright holders to be able to say, that there was infringing content on a website and be able to, um, outside of the courts, without having to prove it, uh, shut down an entire website by going to ISPs and, and there would be a process for that, but it would basically be an on and off switch and um, one that would shut down entire websites speech, basically, um, over a single piece of content. Or in an alleged way. So um, when it, it, it was obviously an overreach of legislation, um, when you think about whether or not you should wake up to uh, the internet and see your favorite website go down uh, for no reason and um, without any sort of process around it. And uh, that was in the fall of 2010. It was slated to passage and it seemed like without a giant protest on the internet, this bill would have passed. And for the most part, all the tech companies, all the websites, uh, excuse me, I'm a little sick, but um, were going, were, we, and policymakers were expecting this to pass. And, but, the internet decided we do something. And it it's significant because not only was this a maximalist piece of legislation that would have damaged the internet and all of the good things that we like about the internet, um, it was going to uh, just happen. And, but because the internet was able to organize and bring the threat to scale so quickly, um, this is the first piece of legislation that we've seen that actually killed such a, ex, you know, expected to be passed legislation with no opposite, no previously organized opposition um, in a matter of months. And so Congress was um, completely surprised. Um, and so were we. I mean, it just didn't, we didn't think that we could so quickly uh, be able to organize like that. And that was, that was really what I think captured the imagination of people on all sides of the debate because it's pretty remarkable how powerful the internet can be when there's such a big threat. Um, so I hope that's a good intro. Uh, there are lots of things that happened obviously to make that happen but it was significant and Congress still to this day, they don't want to get sobered. And I think that is, that it's still a watershed moment that, uh, that, you know, we, we have as a watermark for us to try to reach for the next time there is something that big again. Yeah, and one, one line that you, um... Used in your perspective, really stayed with me, and that that's the line. Uh, lobbyists and legislators weren't allowed to think about anything else. Like uh, the wave of pressure uh, that came onto Congress, like it was really unprecedented. Ten million um, contacts uh, to representatives, to senators, um, 
it was absolutely incredible. And uh, that was because the blackout wasn't just an internet blackout. It wasn't just we're taking down these websites. It was also like a mass mobilization campaign to contact your representative, to contact uh, legislators and tell them that this is, this is not okay. As, as I recall, uh, and Corey, um, I'd be curious if this this reflects uh, your understanding of how this this unfolded as well. As I recall, like basically, folks assumed this was this was going to just pass. Uh, everyone was kind of out on autopilot. Everyone was on board with this legislation in Congress, and then, whereas Tiffany said, like uh, folks were taken by surprise by this this blackout by this. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I was in Washington D.C. not long before the passage, and you know, I'm not a a hill insider by any means. I'm I'm much more of a outside the tent pissing in than inside the tent pissing out kind of guy. But I know a lot of those inside the tent pissing out types, people who are of goodwill, but who've been brought into the establishment. And universally, what they told me in the run up to the SOPA vote was that, um, you know, my brief when I left DC was to go home and think about what we would do in a post SOPA world, that organizing resistance was a waste of time. The the fix was in, the votes were counted. And, you know, as as Aaron Swartz told it, the we knew the the tide was changing when lawmakers who had sponsored the bill stood up on the floor to denounce it, which is always <laughs> always a trip to have people telling you what a terrible idea those other people had when those other people includes themselves. Uh, and, you know, it, it, as, as Tiffany said, they couldn't think about anything else. Eight million phone calls were put through Congress's switchboard in 72 hours. And um, that made a significant impression. Mishi, I'm, I'm curious in your own legal practice, how, uh, how, uh, what echoes did this, uh, this unprecedented blackout have um, for activism for your work uh, in India as well as in the United States when it comes to understanding uh, the impact of legislation when it comes to mobilizing resistance against bad legislation? Thank you. Um, I'm just awed that uh, with these people to be here with all of you who have done wonderful public things. But I must ask you to think of me as a person uh, who lawyers for people like them. And sometimes I'm a scout who comes for a sporadic moment to keep them out of trouble. <laughs> and at other times I come along behind them trying to exploit um, the extraordinary opportunities their activism has created. But no matter what I do, whether I'm out ahead or coming up behind, uh, everything I'm gonna say today is going to seem less immediate and direct uh, because um, the activist job is to be immediate and direct and make all these things happen as Corey and Tiffany have been talking about. And the um, lawyer's job is just a lawyer's job. <laughs> so whether it's the clients I've represented in the past, such as the Free Software Foundation movement, which has had the DRM website, it has been running a variety of things um, the interesting bit is sometimes you get involved into by just, can you check, we are going to run this campaign and can you check the language kind of a thing? And then you get sucked into the details of it behind the scenes. So uh, what interestingly to me, it's um, the impact the entire movement here had, what the reverberations which the rest of the world heard. Um, in our own organization in India, I think the pivot became much clearer that how so many different stakeholders could join hands and then could actually change certain things. The fact that uh, internet.org, which was uh, free basics by Facebook, um, was uh, kicked out of India in 2015, had a lot of inspiration from what people were able to achieve at that point in time. And uh, uh, because um, there is no tech conversation, which uh, will nowadays happen without Twitter or Elon Musk being mentioned in the past two weeks. I will say that uh, one interesting thing which stood out to me much later on was uh, that that time people talked about 2.4 million tweets were talked about this and even Mark Zuckerberg used Twitter to ask people to talk about this. But the most important bit there um, was, I will say, 
um, that the civil society was able to come together in different forms and make a point by turning the internet off which in yeah. today's world is not going to be possible. But what it spawned and what it inspired all around the world um, in terms of various other movements and how people started to view things, um, that, was the mo that, that was the major point that you could actually make a difference and make a change, even when the details are not clear. And a lot of times the people who are bringing this um, take it for granted that there's not going to be much which can come in its way uh, or have not even read, which are often happens, have not even read for what, read what they're recommending. Um, but um, uh, to me, that's the most important bit about um, that civil society turned off a basic lifeline to make a point. Um, and um, uh, everyone else was watching because now the world has moved to a different uh, regime in terms of where the markets are and the importance of what happened that is going to also determine what we will do in future. Yeah, and uh, just to get in there, I, I think we haven't explained what actually happened during the Sokol blackout. And I think the free basics um, example you cite it, it is actually uh, brings us back to it, which is it was the first time that civil society groups, individuals, internet users in the millions, along with tech companies and websites actually worked together and were able to organize each other. Um, and that's, that's the part that the internet helps to bring to scale or make uh, accelerate to, to this you know, two month mark um, that actually made it so that the internet shut down for a day. And it was the internet blackout, the world's largest, or the history's largest online protest because um, all of these groups figured out how to work together because of a threat that was so large. Um, and I think the internet stood up to that challenge and obviously in that case won. And then Free Basics, which happened a few years later, we actually talked to them and they amazingly, and it's often really hard to harness the same kind of energy a few years later, but were able to harness a really, really similar energy um, using really similar tactics that we talked about and worked on with them. And it was incredible to see another moment where this could happen in, in such a big country. Um, so I think it, there, there's things we can talk about on why that worked and why that can't work again. But um, I think the, the fact that, that it happened, it's really hopeful. Yeah, to, to your point, Tiffany, um, I wanted to share a few examples of um, blacked out websites as well for those uh, who uh, didn't see it happen uh, in real time. Is the screen share coming through okay? Yeah. Um, so this is, of course, the, the Wikipedia um, blackout page. Um, this is the version which had the uh, contact your representatives form on it, uh, which we uh, really put together at, at the last minute with the zip code uh, database to uh, look at your representatives fixing bugs um, uh, at the last minute to make sure that you're connected to the right uh, congressperson. Um, this was us um, at uh, Wikimedia Foundation uh, working in this uh, so-called war room uh, that we had set up uh, just to plan uh, the blackout very carefully. And it was a real blackout. I think that's important uh, to note. Uh, like, yes, you could work around it, but it was kind of troublesome uh, to work around it. You had to switch to the mobile side, turn up JavaScript, prevent it from loading. Like, it was definitely not like just like, oh, it's a banner, I'll click it away. Like, it was really making it harder for you um, to get to uh, Wikipedia, which was a pretty big deal, which is a contrast with what uh, other websites were doing, like Google. Uh, and other big tech sites um, did more uh, symbolic things like putting a, a black bar on uh, the Google logo, which is of course very noticeable, but at the same time doesn't really prevent you from doing anything. 
Um, and then uh, you had like very big landing pages like uh, the Mozilla landing page, uh, just telling folks uh, to uh, take action against this uh, legislation, uh, wired blacking out, WordPress blacking out, uh, memes, of course. <laughs> What's so far? I should go look it up on Wikipedia. Oh, no. Um, and at the same time, there's, of course, the, the sharp contrast um, with uh, the, the big social media sites, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook actually saying we're not going to, to be part of this directly. Uh, yes, uh, Mark tweeted about it, uh, but there was no Facebook blackout. There was no Twitter blackout. Um, Google was one of the big tech firms that did uh, something, but again, it didn't go as far. And still, um, one thing that I think in this current environment is worth noting, like even then, uh, a lot of this grassroots energy against SOPA, uh, folks tried to connect that with what big tech was doing and say, like, oh, this is just big tech, like masquerading as and being a grassroots movement. In, in reality, it's just Google controlling these people and uh, telling them um, what to do. Um, so that was the, the SOPA blackout itself. Um, but then, uh, of course, uh, during the SOPA blackout, uh, I should say this as well, hundreds of thousands uh, or over 100,000 individual websites um, blacked out. It wasn't just the big, big name websites, a lot of people uh, participate in forms big and small. But before that, uh, in uh, early in November, there was already a precursor to the super blackout called American Censorship Day. Uh, Tiffany, can you talk a little bit about how that worked? Yeah, I mean, American Censorship Day was the first protest against SOPA that really seeded what became the uh, SOPA blackout on January 18th. And um, it came up, it, it was the idea of the protest. And that was what was significant because prior to American Censorship Day, uh, the opposition to SOPA was on, you know, on blogs, in articles, um, and in petitions. And those are really, really important for educating and building the base, obviously. But realizing that you could use your website you can take a tool, build a tool so that any website could join, use their property and actually deny people access so that it was a real protest of if, if Congress is going to do this, we're going to show how much it could, what this actually means and do something that matters where we have skin in the game. And that showed how much people actually care. Um, and I think, uh, so, so American Censorship Day was the first time that the, this idea of what a protest could on the internet actually looks like, like a real has teeth protest looks like. Um, that's what American Censorship Day did. And it also, I think really set, uh, said honestly what this bill was about. And it was, and we called it the first um, American censorship system, and if, if, if it were to pass, because it would be a way in which you could sort of on and off um, turn, turn off websites. Um, and at that time, the big uh, website that participated that we, you know, I think we all did a lot of organizing to make happen and to get the idea uh, to take hold um, started with Boing Boing Corey, and um, and then we got to Tumblr uh, through through all different channels of tons of people helping um, to make that happen, M making the policy case, making the legal case, making the activism case, and um, so because of that, there were uh, millions of contacts, eighty thousand calls. Congress was surprised then too, um, but that's when the internet went ablaze on this issue, and. From there, and um, Eric knows this well, um, there was a question, okay, we didn't kill this bill with American Censorship Day because that's just, that's just building towards what we really need to do is really make sure everybody on the internet sees this for one day and that's all they see. And that's the, that was the essential powerful idea behind the blackout. It's um, that actually ended up happening, but in those months, it was organizing within the Wikimedia community because, uh, and, and lots of other communities, I think Craigslist and Reddit 
are also um, did as much as uh, Wikime Wikipedia, Wikimedia, um, but it was those months of talking and thinking about what the stakes are, why one should do it, and really convincing each other. I think there was this, this amazing, if you saw it, and I don't know if it's ever, it's archived at all, the bottom up discussion of why Wikipedia should do this that actually led to the final decision. That was hard work. And um, that's the kind of thing that once you, uh, that that leads to big things like this. And I absolutely, uh, Wikipedia actually shutting down was one of the biggest reasons why SOPA died. Um, without that, it would have, it would not be the same. Yeah, and huge, huge uh, credit goes to uh, Jimmy Wells for bringing that conversation to the English Wikipedia community, uh, stimulating lots, lots of debate there. And I uh, just cross-linked the uh, Wikipedia Zopa initiative uh, page on English Wikipedia. It is a huge page, so it might uh, slow down your browser considerably if you try to load it right now. Uh, just because of the sheer amount of uh, discussion uh, that, that took place in the community, but is very much um, leaning towards, we must do something here, like this is a big deal. Um, what is super interesting on this page, if you check it out today, is like the depth of that discussion. Like it was definitely like a Wikipedia discussion in the sense of like, let's talk about like what this legislation really means. Like the Wikimedia Foundation General Counsel at the time, Jeff Brigham provided like a detailed legal analysis. Like these are the changes that Congress has made to date. Uh, they are still not enough. Here's why it's still a big deal. So it was a really informed and a rich discussion and, and the kind that you, you rarely see in, in online activism. Tiffany, you, you pointed out something really important, which is this this notion of individual websites participating. I think when we think about online protests today, often we talk about like social media hashtag campaigns, which is a very different thing. Like you're going through a corporate gatekeeper and saying, hey, we're going to use your platform to mobilize against X or Y cause. Here, it was individual website owners who said, I'm going to take my website and enlist it in this cause. Uh, Corey, um, how did Boing Boing come to that decision to participate as like an example of a website uh, joining a cause like this? You know, I, I think that um, you've, you've just come to the heart of the matter. And, you know, the answer to how did Boing Boing come to do it is, uh, it, it the, is very anodyne and it tells you, I think, what's changed because the way Boing Boing decided to do it is we decided there's four of us. We ran the website and we <laughs> said, this is wrong. We're going to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been doing this. I've just had my 20th anniversary with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I've been I've been doing this for a long time. And when I think about SOPA, which is which comes halfway through my activist career, it, it makes me think about what happened before and what happened after. And so the, I, one of my formative memories of internet activism after I joined EFF was the new royalty guidelines from the Copyright Arbitration Royalty Panel, the most bizarre and boring anodyne thing you can imagine, but it had enormous consequences. So CARP was a panel that the, was struck by the Copyright Office to figure out what it would cost to stream music on internet radio stations. And what they said when they sat down to do this is internet radio is already a thing, um, mostly thanks to Carl Malamud, who I think a lot of us know and love. Uh, and so we're just going to set like a, a dummy rate and then we're going to have this panel and we're going to meet with all the stakeholders and figure out the prices. And so during that period, that interregnum, a couple, three years at the start of the 2000s, there was this incredible outpouring of internet radio where like David Byrne had a station he broadcast from like his spare room of just stuff that he loved and everyone was doing it, teenagers, everyone. And then CARP met and they came up with a royalty rate that was so high that all of those stations shut down overnight, like bam, gone. And I was talking with someone from the record industry's policy side about this. And what they said is, we don't like having a bunch of people just able to set up and do what they want. What we want is to have like five companies in the industry, and then we will meet with them individually and we will negotiate a bespoke deal that's good for all of us, right? Well, that's what we've got now, right? We've got Spotify and Pandora and YouTube Music, Amazon Music, a couple more. And um, the record industry, for the most part, are big investors in those streamers. And they have over and over again, 
negotiated lower per stream royalties, the opposite of what they did back in the carp days, lower per stream royalties, because when Spotify pays a lower royalty to the artists, they pay a higher dividend to their shareholders. And if you're Universal Music and you get a dividend, it goes to your shareholders. If you're Universal Music and you get a royalty, it goes to your workforce, it goes to the musicians. So this was a way of, engineers would call it impedance matching, right? Five giant record companies, five giant internet companies, they all sit down, they don't always agree, they're gonna fight a lot about um, how many points should be shifted from this side of the balance sheet to that side, what music owns or entertainment owns and what tech owns and back and forth. But they want the same uh, kinds of negotiating policy because then you don't get these unquantifiable risks like tens of thousands of independently managed websites run by committees of four weirdos who say, oh no, we're just gonna black out our page because we don't like a piece of legislation. They can't even enumerate all the people who might do that, much less target them in any meaningful way. So right after CARP, there was a day when a piece of legislation very similar to SOPA was tabled in 50 state houses at once. And it was a very chaotic uh, piece of legislation and different names in different states. And it ended up not going anywhere in part because most of this copyright stuff is federal. But um, at the time, I remember colleagues at EFF being spitting mad because they were like, Microsoft is a giant monopolist and they can't even put a lobbyist in every state house. Like, what is the point of having a tech sector that's being corrupted by a giant monopolist if they can at least shake a few pennies loose from the back of the sofa cushions to have someone in all 50 state houses? Because we were like 12 people at the time. We weren't gonna have people in 50 state houses watching this stuff. And we kind of got our wish, right? Now, Microsoft and the other tech platforms, they have basically come together and formed a cohesive bargaining block. And where we used to get together and say, okay, we're going to block out tens of thousands of websites in, in order to change Congress's mind. Now we say, we're going to black out our avatars to change an executive's mind at a tech company in the hopes that they might go and change Congress's mind. And, you know, the thing we worried about in the days of SOPA was that you would have five record executives or six movie executives or five TV executives who would just have the power of life and death over entire websites, for, for, you know, what you might call it for, in ad tech, a vertical, right? Like the, the place where everyone gets their information about cars, say, would suddenly be uh, live or die based on the whims of an executive. And that's what we've got. Right, that is what we've got because those independent websites effectively don't exist and to the extent they exist 100 percent of their revenue comes from an ad tech duopoly facebook and google who just unilaterally and opaquely make these choices and and so we now have our our communications infrastructure being structured by unaccountable groups of individuals and rather than being able to participate directly, all we do is sit on the sidelines and wonder whether Elon Musk is gonna buy Twitter, right? And whether, whether Elon Musk will become God Emperor of Twitter the way Mark Zuckerberg appointed himself God Emperor for life of 3 billion people's social lives. And I, I'm gonna, I know I've been talking for a long time, but I wanna end by saying uh, something that, that really made me change the way I thought about this stuff around 2003, 2004 which was I read a paper by Tim Wu, um, who was then a, a communications pro, uh, professor and a protege of Larry Lessig's, uh, called Copyrights Communications Policy. And Tim was a scholar of um, monopoly and telecoms. And he said, you know, the telecoms industry, one of the reasons they're so powerful is not just that they're really concentrated, although that's really important because not a lot of people have to agree for the telecoms industry to have a common position, but they're just really cozy. Right. When, when, like, there's only four or five companies in an industry and they're all like, and, the, and it's been that way for several years. You know, if you're an exec at like Sprint, there's nowhere in the org chart for you to go up. And so you get like poached by AT&T and they make a box in the org chart. And then AT&T loses you back to Sprint, who makes a new box in the org chart to put you in because they'll do it when they're hiring an AT&T executive, but not promoting a Sprint executive. So you have people like John Legere, the, the, uh, uh, un-CEO of T-Mobile, right, who 
you know, merged the company with, with Sprint, who said, you know, I'm not like any of these other people, and I'm not like any of the, and, and my company's not like any of these other companies. He was like an at t and Sprint executive before he was a T-Mobile executive, who then like d merged with those companies, right? It's, it's like, these aren't the Montagues and the Capulets, right? Like Sheryl Sandberg is not the bitter enemy of Google. Google and Facebook are not at each other's throat. Sheryl Sandberg's a senior Googler who is now the second most senior Facebooker. And, you know, like maybe the reason Bob Iger and, and Rupert Murdoch were able to merge Disney and Fox, those two great polar opposites of our media empires, uh, because they were star-crossed lovers who secretly yearned for one another, or maybe their differences were completely cosmetic. And they both agreed that what we really need is to have all of our industry structured by a couple, three great men, right? Like they basically got Ayn Rand brain worms. And, you know, it, that is, I think, become uh, what's become of our internet it, and, and our other industries. And I mentioned Tim Wu here. And the reason I mentioned Tim Wu is not because he's not just because he's an old friend. We went to elementary school together. We've known each other since we were shooting each other with crossbows in Dungeons and Dragons games when we were nine years old. But also because Tim is now in charge of tech antitrust at the White House. And we are living through a moment that I think gets lost in these discussions about copyright or harassment or, um, uh, you know, culture war stuff or policies about about censorship and so on, which is that the, the, the common thread between all of these is not that the people who run the internet have bad judgment, although they assuredly do. It's that there's a group of people who run the internet unaccountably. And the most important thing that's going on in our politics right now is the change in antitrust law between Lena Khan at the FTC and Cantor at the D Department of Justice, Wu in the White House, Vestager in the European Commission, the stuff that's going on with the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, um, new thoughts about antitrust in China and India, all over the world. We are finally starting to talk about whether or not it is healthy for the nervous system of the 21st century to be presided over by a handful of unaccountable dorks who are no better or worse than you and me. They're just like ordinary mediocrities who happen to lack the moral compass that prevents people from becoming monopolists. And you know, there are people on my side who say this is uh, no good because what's really happening is the telecoms and entertainment companies are hoping to nerf the power of tech. And that's totally true. They are 100% on this. But they're making an incredibly stupid bargain or, or bet rather. You know, big telco and big content are betting that we can wake up the antitrust, gi antitrust giant for 40 years in a coma, get it to smash big tech, let them pick up the pieces and absorb it, and then it will go back to sleep. And the reality is that when we wake the antitrust sleeping giant from its coma, we will turn it against every one of those monopolies. And the way that we'll wake it from its coma is by having all the people are harmed by every kind of monopoly, the two companies that own all the beer and the four companies that do all the shipping and the one company that owns all the cheerleading uniforms. And, you know, you name it, it's all being organized under a handful of companies that are just as venal and corrupt and corrupting as the tech industry and as the entertainment industry. We're all going to make a coalition and we're going we're gonna to send that giant out to smash these other giants. It will be the people's giant because we, we are, do ourselves an enormous disservice when we uh, brief for, say, the tech giants to fight the entertainment giants. Because, you know, if they win, they're not going to drop crumbs from their plates onto the floor for us. All they're going to do is increase their own uh, share of things. We need a people's giant, and I think we're on the verge of getting one. Yeah, so that is, I think, one of the the answers to like what is what is going to have to happen now in, in this current environment, and, and I'd love to explore what some of the other answers are in, in terms of like the, the future of online activism, uh, as well as other ways that we can counter this uh, concentrated uh, monopoly power. Um, but before I, I go there. I did promise the panelists that um, we would take questions from the audience in between. And if there are questions from the audience that relate to specifically what happened 
uh, back in 2012. And that would be a great question to, a great point to uh, put one of those questions in, in between here. Isaac, do we have any uh, any questions that relate to the, the silver blackout itself and what happened there? Yeah, thanks, Eric. We do a few. Um, the first one was uh, asking whether the panel could reflect on the question of who benefited and how uh, from the blackout. And the example is given, did Google participate because of the uh, do no evil um, or because there is a business interest? Um, in what ways was Google's interest different from Twitter and Facebook's interest who, uh, as you mentioned, did not actually participate? Uh, just quickly, I, Google did benefit, uh, and that's why they participated. Uh, but of course, when you align with that interest and you're fighting for the right answer for putting power, uh, dis distributing power, and I think it was still the right answer, then you can't help but when having people who are companies whose interests also align. But I think... Uh, Whenever we're looking at policies, we're looking at policies of, uh, that are structurally against arbitrary power uh, and for distributing and making sure and ensuring power is decentralized. So um, I, oftentimes that is the best way to figure out whether or not something is important and who benefits in the end. Not to say that Google hasn't uh, exploited that and also gained a lot of power outside of, or beyond that using all different kinds of methods, but we'll get to that. And I'll let you ask questions. Isaac, do we have other questions? Yeah, the next one both has kind of a clarification piece, but I think there's a broader question to it as well. And the clarification piece, which was addressed a little bit in the notes document, is were visitors from outside the United States included in the blackout? Um, but I think the larger question there was, what was the reasoning for this? Um, was collateral damage minimized or international exposure somehow desirable here? It was definitely desirable to have uh, international exposure here. Like it was really a global moment. It was not a, a United States moment. And as, as Michi pointed out earlier, um, it, it was uh, something that had uh, echoes and reverberations like for policy discussions uh, that happened around the world. In fact, the, uh, the silver blackout in, in uh, English Wikipedia uh, discussions about it uh, was directly informed by uh, a blackout that happened uh, on Italian Wikipedia um, a, a few months before related to a, a specific legislation. Um, so it was very much a, a moment uh, that wasn't uh, specific to the United States, but a, a point in time for the whole internet to say, this is a big deal because the consequences unavoidably would have been global. Do we have uh, other questions for the panel as well? Yeah, I think related to that, the uh, Italian blackout was also mentioned, um, but there is a question, I guess, Mishi, you had said um, such a blackout wouldn't be possible today. Um, and they were just looking for clarification as to why uh, you feel that way. Uh, thank you. Um, I think um, I, I just have to point it out that it was so successful uh, what people achieved in 2012 with the SOPA PIPA blackout, that the states, the governments all caught up with it. And now they turn off the internet to prevent people from making a point. So one of the things that has happened in this period is that internet shutdowns, which are the inverse of the black square days, have become a feature of the net. And because states, and governments are big and powerful. They are many and we are few. This has become more common than the protests. It was ultimately designed to co-opt. That's why I spend as much time in our organization tracking on internet shutdowns and worrying about government's attempt to keep people from making any points these days as I do in helping the people who try to use the net to make a point and are pressed upon the governments. Um, during the COVID years from 2020 till date, which are still COVID years, but um, 
government of India shut down internet 245 times. And this is the world's largest democracy. And um, um, uh, I live in two countries, which is the US and I was born in India and go back and forth. Uh, uh, but I have to say the future markets for all the companies are not here. They are in that part of the world now, um, which has 492 million WhatsApp users and uh, 925 million feature phone users. So we haven't even gone to all the people who can be converted to smartphones. And the longest internet shutdown was 552 days of internet deprivation in Kashmir. And this is not an authoritarian government, this is a democratic government. That's why I say that you, yeah, and um, uh, that's why I say that what has happened, what could happen that time, it's not going to happen now. It's also because um, uh, a point uh, which Corey was making is that the pathologies of politics and society in a platform world are becoming much more evident to the global population. And the attention is increasingly being focused on the oligopoly of platform companies, that they have too much power, and they do. And uh, there is a time to be allies with them. And there is a time when you also have to grapple with where the power and the marriages lie. And the top-down structures of government control um, that is contemplated as responses to the power of these companies will only drive over privileged management of these companies into marriages of brutal convenience with these post-truth politicians whose rise these companies have enabled. So um, that's why I say what could happen that time, we are living in a very different world right now. Um, and I don't want to say that uh, I am not uh, hopeful because there are a lot of good things also which can happen, but uh, any good activism or any good strategy begins with a proper assessment of what the what we are facing right now, and what we are facing is very different scenarios of different uh, different worlds um, of all the people who they talked about. Um, Europe does take the lead on regulation, and they think that uh, regulation is how they can address these problems, and because U.S. is the center of the world. Um, they will keep on discussing these things till everybody comes home because innovation, 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 and China, 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 and uh, rest of the world, um, because um, policy moves not progressively towards a safer and more private digital society, but in destructive cycles of recurrent amnesia, in which bad ideas are resurrected only to die again of the conflict between political mythology and technical reality. So um, uh, everyone else will keep copying all the bad ideas and say, you know what, the Americans are doing it, the Europeans are doing it, why can't we do it? And all the good ideas, they can completely and conveniently ignore because we don't have the same enforcement structures as the Europeans have. The Europeans don't have any companies to show for innovation. And uh, the recent actions have also told us that now Russia, China, Iran have their own internet. India, does, India can't even make up its mind, despite the fact that it is a democracy. It has all this educated young people who are not only the back end of these companies, but, are, but now leading these companies. And uh, all of us are still figuring it out whether our fights are going to be tinier and smaller or they're going to be larger and global in a way where the leadership may not come from the places we are used to for those to be coming from. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to one question about clarification. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you. Thank you, Mishi. And, and, and we are getting close to, uh, to the next time that we have today, um, but I do want to make sure that we and this is, in fact, a very good moment to do so. We, we talk about like the, the legislation that is actively under debate right now. And also uh, reflect on like what uh, has changed, like how, how do we need to counter this kind of legislation uh, today? So there, there are, of course, in the United States, 
pieces of legislation that are um, going to potentially harm the internet because they always are. <laughs> you know, like any moment in time, the last 10 years, you would have looked at it. Is there any pending legislation that would be bad for the internet? Yes, there is. But there's there's particularly bad pending legislation right now. There's the, the Earn It Act, uh, which would uh, potentially harm or limit the ability of uh, you know, internet users to use end-to-end -end encryption. And then there's the, the Smart Copyright Act, uh, which you may have received an email from Fight for the Future today about uh, potentially uh, mobilizing online um, protest against uh, that. Uh, specifically, when it comes to the Smart Copyright Act and uh, the campaign that Fight for the Future is organizing about that, uh, Tiffany, can you talk a little bit about that? And also, I, I would be curious um, in that context about your take on whether the uh, the strategies of the civil blackout are repeatable or not. Yeah, thanks. Yes, today is um, the day where we push back against the censorship filter bill, which is the SMART Act, as Eric mentioned. And uh, that's another on off switch that in some ways feels a little more similar to SOPA than other bills have felt or are, are shaped around um, because it actually makes it so that uh, any website, in particular small websites, will have to comply with um, installing a filter that would um, uh, sort of police and scan, scan uh, content and stop content from being uploaded before um, the world gets to assess whether or not it actually is uh, infringing material um, and, uh, and is not art itself. Um, so, uh, that and Wikimedia, I believe, is participating in helping to make sure that Congress is aware that the internet is here, still here. Internet users are here and paying attention and um, are looking for these giant scams. And the bigger the scam, uh, the bigger the outcry. And if it moves along, then I think the outcry will be even bigger. And I think that goes to what Corey and Misha were talking about. I think we're in a completely different stage of communications uh, where the internet, when the, during the days of SOPA, the internet was such that it was about preserving or making sure we have the opportunity for hundreds of thousands, millions of people to have websites or blogs or properties to talk, to express themselves um, and to make things and build things. Now we're in a stage, and, and, and I think that's why SOPA uh, had such a response. I think these days we're talking about an internet that makes people feel mostly conflicted about what side to be on because right now fighting for the internet also feels like you're just fighting for big tech, which makes no sense to most people and protest is blocking out your social media profile. And that doesn't quite feel like a real protest either. There is no damage um, that anyone really feels um, when that happens. So I think we're in a stage where when we talk about all of the problems and the media is, is so good at freaking out about this. And I think journalists have a responsibility here as well as the intelligentsia or whatever um, that they focus on the harms within these um, plot on these platforms that are disproportionate in a disproportionate way to actually a scale of the problem. And um, I think it behooves all of us who have some privilege to think about what actually we should be working on and what will lead to a large scale response and reform or, or change for in the right direction of what is actually more harmful. And um, and not that those problems shouldn't be solved within their silos and that we obviously need more activism in general to sort of lift the veil of the narrative on disinformation and all of that stuff um, and censorship, et cetera. But we actually need people to, we need a dedicated group of people, groups of people who are actually thinking about the real, the larger scale harm, which is that governments and uh, monopolies are, uh, getting more and more powerful to the point where using data and in particular, oh, data and surveillance are synonymous in my mind. Um, so the more surveillance we're allowing to be installed um, and to exist, the greater the power of the most um, arbitrary, or most irresponsible and corrupt 
uh, institutions and players um, grow off of and historically are the major actors who actually do the most harmful things and uh, pit people against each other. So, you know, the minority group targeting in China, um, Russia shutting down protests. These are, these are giant harms that tilt the balance of the mechanisms that we have for uh, democracy towards these extremely strong powers that once they get that much power, it's almost too hard uh, to fight. I mean, China is one of our biggest problems and, um, and because of their surveillance apparatus. So uh, yeah, it's, it's when we talk about where we are with the internet and whether or not we can have another blackout, it's what is the thing we actually should be fighting for that is, has the gravity and scale and comp of an actual problem for humanity um, that it sets us off on the, on the wrong course. And I think when we, I think we're, everybody on this panel is uh, seeing a really similar problem or uh, agrees on where that scale is. And I think we're gonna get there. It's just, we spend too much time in the media focusing on or getting people to freak out <laughs> on things that will resolve humans work out and humans focus on uh, see problems where they focus and they fix them but there's a responsibility to think about and work towards the larger scale problems of actually giving that much surveillance and data and so and power to uh, really unaccountable and large institutions. Thank you so much, Tiffany, and, and thank you to all our, our panelists um, for this, this rich discussion. Um, I think the, the themes that have emerged here are, one, uh, this rise of unaccountable platform power and how we respond to it, um, both by fighting monopolies, uh, by breaking monopolies, and also, uh, frankly, by building uh, and re rebuilding uh, the free and open internet. Like the so-called blackout, as, as, as we pointed out here, was like a a unique moment in the history of the internet. And I really encourage everyone who is not that familiar with that history to study it because it is an important part of our, our collective record and our collective memory. But at the same time, as we've said here today, the, the landscape is changing, uh, the world is changing and we need to respond to the threats of today differently. Like whether it is by uh, directly joining a, a campaign to break up uh, tech giants or whether it is by um, making your social media uh, account on Mastodon as opposed to Twitter, like joining alternative platforms and helping them grow, nurturing back to health uh, the free and decentralized internet that seems to be uh, slowly um, but gradually dying away. Um, you have some options for all of you to explore and I hope some of those points will come up uh, later again uh, today in, in the course of this event. Uh, thank you again all for joining us today. Thank you very much. It was great to see you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for putting this together. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for this amazing, really amazing panel. Am I audible or should I turn off my video? I had some problems before. Great, thank you. So thanks, Eric. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Mishi. Um, for me, this was, I learned a lot and uh, I might not be the only one who feels a bit down <laughs> after this. Um, but thank you for for fighting um, for fighting for keeping the internet as good as it still is at least and making it even better. I was hopeful, just to be clear. And thanks for I keeping up the that. hope. Thanks, yeah. thanks for that. Okay, so we are at the Wikimedia Foundation Research Award of the Year session. Uh, we're going to spend the next uh, 15 minutes uh, just celebrating the work of the researchers uh, who have uh, spent sub substantial work uh, during 2021 uh, to research um, and develop uh, tools, data sets uh, for the Wikimedia projects. Uh, my name is Leila Zia. For those of you who are joining just now, I'm the head of research at the Wikimedia Foundation. I had the pleasure of working with Benjamin Mako Hill from University of Washington to review the work of 2021 and choose the, um, the winners. Um, Jimmy Wales is also with us, and uh, Jimmy is going to present the award uh, to the recipients. 
I'll pass it to Mako. Uh, Mako, please take it from here. Okay. You guys can you can hear me, Lila? Yes. Okay. So uh, let's. Uh, all right. So you're driving the slides. So uh, so uh, I am thrilled to be able to introduce the this year's. Uh, this is the second annual sort of Wikimedia Foundation Research Award of the Year, or WMF Ray. Um, the goal of the awards is really to um, recognize and celebrate uh, research that has been done recently, which has the potential to have to really sort of like this both great research and which also has the potential to really have uh, impact to change and positively impact Wikimedia projects um, and other Wikimedia research. The committee this year was uh, myself at the University of Washington and Leila Zia, who you guys have heard plenty about, um, but who's the head of uh, research at the Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, the eligibility uh, for receiving the award are uh, sort of several things. First, uh, the research must be uh, about or using data from or sort of uh, on in some sense, uh, Wikimedia projects or have the ability to uh, impact those projects indirectly. So if it's not about Wikimedia it directly or uses data from other source, but is sort of framed in a way that has a sort of clear sort of impact on the goals of the Wikimedia movement and the projects, then that's sort of what we're looking for. Um, the papers have to be uh, sort of recent. So for this year, uh, the requirement was that the paper had to be published in the calendar year 2021. There was lots of great stuff that we looked at that was published that, that, that has been published this year or that will be published in the future. And we look forward to coming back uh, and revisiting those things um, later. Uh, because the committee is the two of us, uh, and English is, I believe, the only language we have in common, uh, the, uh, there needs to be a copy of the manuscript in English, um, although it's, uh, it is often the case that work is published in more than one language or with the translation. Um, and uh, critically, there, sh there can't be a conflict of interest uh, between the award committee, that is to say, myself and Leila, and the, um, and the authors of the paper. So uh, there was a lot of really great work that, uh, that, you know, I'm like, wow, this paper is really good. I was like, actually, that person's on my team. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Or this, this work is really good. Oh, yeah, they're in so a student in my lab. So for all of the, I, I, I did see a couple, uh, uh, there's a, at least one student in my lab out there. So know that uh, the reason you're not being recognized is I'm sure only this. But in fact, there was tons and tons of really, really great work that we um, uh, had to evaluate. Uh, we, we, uh, we had a spreadsheet with more than 230 papers, um, which we identified in a, um, a series of different ways. Um, we had a public call for nomination and, no, and a number of people submitted some really excellent work, um, including some self nominations as well, which are welcome and really encouraged. Um, uh, there, uh, we went through the list of all research that was sort of uh, tweeted or retweeted by the Wiki Research account. If you don't follow it, it's a really fantastic way to stay up to date on, uh, you know, new research that's happening in the sort of wiki world and within the Wikimedia sort of uh, research universe. So we looked at every tweet that was there. And then uh, we also, uh, after doing this, did a, um, an extensive, I don't know, a Google Scholar search where, where um, you know, Leila and I were looking, how many pages are we going to go until we, we're going to keep going? Uh, um, so we, 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 went, we went deep uh, to identify things that we may have missed. And we've seen most of them, but we did identify a few other um, great candidates that way as well. This year, we're giving. Uh, uh, we're structuring things a little bit differently. Um, we're giving decided to give two awards. Um, the first is the WMF Ray 2022 award, which is uh, uh, an award that we're using to recognize sort of the, the, the best paper, according to our evaluation, that sort of uses Wikimedia data to understand and improve uh, Wikimedia projects or the broader web ecosystem, and which opens sort of critical questions, you know, all the stuff that I sort of uh, mentioned in terms of the goal. And then we decided this year to actually recognize um, a, a best student paper, which is a paper that does all those things, um, uh, but which also was written by a first author who was a student at the time the paper was published. Uh, so this way we can sort of uh, highlight some of the really great work um, that students are doing in this space. Um, uh, so uh, that was sort of the goal here. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So uh, there is a physical award and a certificate uh, which will be uh, given out this year. So a number of you uh, will know that Wikimedians, people within the sort of like broader and actually on other wikis as well, tend to give these virtual awards called barn stars to each other. And they're um, uh, 
barn stars are real things in the world. There are there are often pieces of metal that are sort of like attached to the sides of barns, but there are these virtual barn stars. These are these sort of pictures of awards that anyone can give to anyone else um, for work that is really special. So if, if you notice someone on Wikipedia, if you're a Wikipedian and you notice someone on Wikipedia who's really just going above and beyond, you can go and uh, give them a virtual barn star, this little award, and say, I award you this barn star for doing something really great and important. Um, uh, we will be sending physical barn stars to each of the winning groups, um, which means we'll be in contact if you're one of the winners um, about a physical mailing address. And I should say, because I noticed Kai, who's one of our winners uh, from last year uh, here um, uh, in the room, we actually failed to send physical awards to the winners last year. Um, so uh, one, we apologize. And two, uh, we're including you in the process as well. So we're starting the process um, now. And we've actually made a lot of progress and identified some uh, uh, um, uh, we're ready to get these um, sent, um, and we apologize for being late for the people that won uh, last year. So um, uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to Jimmy Wells, we'll be announcing the winners. Um, the process is going to be that uh, Jimmy's going to introduce uh, each of the winners of the awards and tell you a little bit about the um, papers. Everyone will be invited to unmute and clap, and then we um, have uh, um, invited the authors of the papers to say something for a few minutes. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jimmy. Great, thank you. Uh, great, so the WMF Ray 2022 award goes to a paper that describes a new data set. The data set builds on data from the Wikimedia projects and has the potential to enable and significantly accelerate research and development for adding captions to images across more than 100 Wikipedia languages. Today, more than half of Wikipedia articles are unillustrated and more than half of the images available to us don't have captions. Wikipedia needs more images that have captions in local languages to better support different learning and accessibility needs on the project. Captions are also very important in improving the search experience of users on Wikipedia. Manually adding captions to large number of images, particularly in under-resourced language communities, is an enormous task. In recent years, models have been developed to automatically generate captions for images. However, these models are generally biased towards English and Western content due to a variety of reasons, including biased training sets. The researchers and engineers behind this paper take the Wikipedia data that is already publicly shared, process it, and ultimately make it immediately usable by many members of the scientific and developer communities. All signs indicate significant impacts by this paper. Less than a year after publication, uh, the publication already received more than 30 citations. Wikimedia Foundation organized a public image caption matching competition based on the data set, which in turn has resulted in at least four open source solutions for automatically retrieving text closest to an image on Wikipedia. And a new community has come to life with a focus on multimodal and multilingual machine learning research on Wikipedia with the first event of this community, Wiki ML3 workshop to take place on April 29th as part of the ICLR conference. For all these reasons, we award the WMF Ray 2022 to WIT, WIT, Wikipedia-based image text data set for multimodal, multilingual machine learning. That's a mouthful. Uh, machine learning. So now uh, I think Mako is going to get you to unmute and So that's great. Uh, okay, so we'll move on then to the student award. Um, <clears throat> Wikidata, the free and open knowledge base is enormously important to the Wikimedia community as well as the broader ecosystem that Wikimedia operates in and serves. Across the world, people and businesses rely on the statements stored in Wikidata for a range of activities such as making new content available in languages that we don't have content in, building smart assistants, training AI systems, and more. Many of the statements in Wikidata come with references. According to Wikidata's community policies, these references are to meet three criteria, reference, authoritativeness, and ease of access. Wikidata's quality and reliability and its impact depends upon the fact that its references are generally perceived to be high quality in all of these three senses. The WMF Ray 2022 Best Student Paper Award goes to a paper that seeks to understand how high quality the references in Wikidata really are. This research evaluates the state of references in Wikidata. It describes an enormous amount of work that involves a creative set of methods that combine multiple rounds of automatic and manual assessment into a complex and multi-stage research project. 
It conducts its evaluation using Wikidata community's own guidelines, making its result directly usable by the community. Its analysis is conducted in six different languages. It provides a detailed report card for the Wikimedia community about the state of Wikidata references. It makes the full data and code for the project available so that others can reproduce this analysis as the community improves and matures. And it was conducted by a team led by Gabriel Amaral, a PhD student and research associate at King's College of London, whose dissertation is on this topic. For all these reasons, we award the WMA Ray 2022 Best Student Paper Award to Assessing the Quality of Sources in Wikidata Across Languages, a Hybrid Approach. There we go. All right. And if I, if I could just add uh, just one more little thought, sort of a personal thought about these. For me, one of the, the most important things, one of the most fundamental and important things about the world of Wikipedia and Wikimedia is the global scope of everything that we do. And by global, that means not just languages, but also accessibility in all of its forms. And so I think both of these papers really are incredibly helpful for that. Uh, I love the concept of giving uh, sort of machine assisted uh, tools to the communities to help them do their work in a more efficient way. You know, let computers do what computers do best and let the humans do the creative and fun, clever stuff. So thank you very much. This is fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. So I think that, uh, I think that we're going to try to do one thing we wanted to try to do was do a, a group photo with the uh, um, with the winners. So maybe let's do the um, the first piece, the wit team. Um, so I think that the process. What's the best process here? We want people that are uh, the the winners to maybe turn their video on, and the people that are not the winners to turn their video off. Is that how this is going to work? That is correct. Okay. All right. So if you did not win the award. Uh, better luck next year, but, uh, um, and if you uh, turn, turn your video off, and if you did win the award, if you're from the, um, from the WIT team, first, um, maybe turn your video on. Is this? Shop 2022, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Larry Lessig, who's a professor of law and leadership at Harvard uh, law, law School. Among the legal scholars, Larry is known for many of his work over the past few decades, in, including Creative Commons, as well as advocating for the public domain, cop copyright reform, and campaign finance reform. Um, and of course, many of you know that Larry is no stranger to the Wikimedia world. In fact, the Wikimedia projects have benefited substantially from a lot of scholarly and underground ground work that he has done over the past two decades. Um, in 1999 and 2000, Larry wrote two papers uh, with the subjects, the law of the horse, what cyber law might teach, and code is law. And these papers really revolutionized the way we approach policy questions related to software and code, and more broadly, the web. He taught us that um, with each line of code that we write, we make a decision about not only the code, but also fundamental issues such as freedom and privacy, and he anticipated some of the debates that we are still seeing today about regulating cyber, cyberspace when code is treated as law. In 2001, Larry founded Creative Commons, a nonprofit organization devoted to expanding the breadth of creative work that is available to all of us across the world to build upon and legally share. Those of you who have published paper in the web conference have benefited from the CC BY 3 license, which is one of the licenses that the Creative Commons um, has put out there. Today, of course, Creative Commons uh, licenses are core to Wikipedia's ability to surface text and media to people across the globe. Um, Larry, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being in Wiki Workshop, and please take it from here. Great, thank you so much. So um, I'm actually in the bowels of New York right now planning the revolution, um, and it was not gonna be a great space. I'm actually in like a painting room or something. Um, it wasn't gonna be a great space to try to coordinate the technology of making a presentation properly. So I got up at the crack of dawn yesterday morning and I recorded what I wanna to present to you today. And so I wanna present it um, and it's about a half an hour long. And then I'm eager to take, you know, to turn that off and then we come back for questions. Um, so if it's okay, let, I'll just launch right into the recording and um, let's hope that this is going to work. I'm gonna turn my video off and then I'm going to start with the recording. So in 1999, I published the book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, 
And that book was quickly rendered as a meme, Code is Law. But actually the point of that book was to tell a story about regulation generally. There was, I said, at the core of any regulation, the pathetic red dot, us. And we were regulated by many modalities of regulation. Law regulated us when the law says, do not speed. Norms regulate us when we say, for example, we declare our pronouns. Markets regulate us when they say, we'll pay you $15 an hour rather than 10. And most interestingly, architecture regulates us. The world we find it, my favorite MIT t-shirt, 186,000 miles per second. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. This idea that the way we find the world also gives us affordances and restrictions also is itself a kind of regulator. And as applied to cyberspace, that regulator of architecture is code. But even more fundamental to the argument I was trying to make 23 years ago was that at the top of this structure of regulation was the law. Because the law, uniquely among these regulators, could reach out and affect the other regulators. The law, of course, regulated directly, but the law could be used to change the norms. Think about norms around smoking to make it harder to engage in smoking. The law could regulate the market for cigarettes by, for example, taxing cigarettes. Of course, we subsidize tobacco, but put that aside to make it harder to consume cigarettes. And the law could, as the Clinton administration considered, regulate the architecture of cigarettes themselves, reducing the nicotine in cigarettes to make the devices less addictive. The point then was that we need to recognize the mix of regulation and the mix can change. And that there was an incentive to change that mix, at least as it applied to cyberspace. The architecture of freedom that we celebrated so much at the birth of the internet, an architecture that gave us free speech and privacy and an open neutral platform for innovation would become, I argued, an architecture of control. So we needed to defend the code to sustain our values. Now, that point seemed to me obvious back then. Turned out it wasn't. First time I presented this argument to a group of technologists, a woman came up to me literally crying, saying, I don't do politics. She wanted not to do politics. I had to insist. Her code was politics. Or when my book was reviewed by the New York Times, David Pogue wrote, Lessig plays digital Cassandra, and predicts that the internet will become a monster that tracks our every move, but that no one will heed his warning. He went on, these discussions are thoughtful and measured, but the premise that frames them all is shaky. Lessig doesn't offer much proof that a Soviet-style loss of privacy and freedom is on its way. And unlike actual law, internet software has no capacity to punish. It doesn't affect people who aren't online, and only a tiny minority of the world population is. And if you don't like the internet system, you can always flip off the modem. Well, that's true. You could always flip off the modem. But the point was that I thought Pogue was missing something back then. And unfortunately, I think 20 years later, most people agree he was. Okay, that was the argument then. But the point now is different. I think we need to recognize that me and my lawyer-centric view was wrong about the dominant force in this architecture of regulation. It's not the law that's at the top. It's the market that's at the top, the market. Because the market too can affect these other modalities of regulation. The market regulates directly, of course, when the market says, for example, the cost of living is high in one place and not as high in another place, this cartoon that I saw when I was in Taiwan. Or the market could regulate the architecture of cyberspace or of the world to make it so that the infrastructure is more addictive. Or the market can regulate the norms that define how we exist and get along with each other to make it so we are more eager to spend our time online rather than with each other, as Sherry Turkle puts so nicely in her book, Alone Together. 
or the market can regulate the law itself by driving through campaign contributions or whatever other influences it might, the law to change to better serve the market. That was the example we saw with copyright, where Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, setting up a notice and takedown provision, made it possible for platforms such as YouTube and many others to exist and to flourish. So the point together, if you think of all of these together, is that markets are regulating the regulators today, not democracy, and it's regulation through economic power. Now, focus on one critical example of this regulation of the market in our world. The internet has a business model today, not everywhere, but it is dominant. That business model is advertising. Advertising has needs. It has the needs for engagement and data. It drives engagement to gather data. So how does it drive engagement? It drives engagement by hacking us. That might be an unfamiliar idea, but I think it's familiar if you think about the idea of body hacking. So think about food, not food like this, but food like this or this or this, or most importantly, something like this. I'm talking about processed food, food that is architected and designed and in that perspective, behold the brilliance of this, the buffalo wings, which are the perfect mix of salt, sugar, and fat to make that food addictive. It's a miracle in the sense that Tide is a miracle because it's just a choice, a design choice by food scientists, by food architects, people who work to engage in a process of science to engineer food to overcome a natural resistance that we might otherwise have to this food so that we just can't stop consuming it. These scientists are exploiting evolution with the aim, the aim obviously, to make money. Now for some people, this is perfectly harmless, but for other people, it is not. And they know, the companies know, that we can't resist what they offer us. That's what their scientists tell us. But the key to recognize is that they too, the companies, can't resist providing what they provide. Michael Moss in this fantastic book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, tells the story of executives in the processed food industry who come to know, come to recognize the harm they are doing to the consumers who consume their food. And they choose to try to make their food more healthy. And then of course, people don't want to eat the healthy version of their processed food. And so the market for those products declines and then the executives are quickly kicked out and the companies go back to their old ways claiming the market made us do it. Okay, so that's body hacking. There's an equivalent in the internet context we should recognize as brain hacking. Tristan Harris, former Google engineer, now founder of the Center for Humane Technology describes a similar science. It's the science of Silicon Valley. It's the science to engineer attention to overcome resistance, not of bodies, but of brains. The means are the same, exploiting evolution. Turns out we are just wildly uh, responsive to random rewards, or it turns out we just can't resist bottomless pits of content. And so by overcoming resistance, they are addicting us to engage in their platform. And then they collect the digital exhaust, the mouse droppings, to better understand what we want, not just by watching us, as they might sit by on the side of a road and count cars that go by, but by being active in poking and tweaking and asking us, rendering us vulnerable as users of this platform, reaching down, as Harris puts it, the brain stack to leverage our insecurity so that we reveal more. This is the business model of Facebook and Instagram so that we do more, so that we reveal more, so that they see more, so that they can sell ads better. This is the world of surveillance capitalism as Shoshana Zuboff describes it in her magisterial work with that title. And all this makes, they tell us, the internet possible. It gives us the internet and it gives them a business. It's win-win from the perspective of the internet makers except that it's not. 
because the unintended consequences, and let's really hope they are unintended, the unintended consequences of this surveillance are devastating. They're devastating for individuals as we see an extraordinary rise in teen suicide, especially among younger people, but they're devastating for society and particularly for democracy. <clears throat> because as the AI that is embedded in these platforms selectively amplifies and suppresses content for the purpose of driving our engagement as it elevates the crazy and suppresses the balanced, because it just turns out we are so susceptible to spreading and engaging with the crazy and not so much the sensible. Its choices, the choices of these AIs have effects. And one effect in the context of democracy is to drive and spread hate. Because it just turns out, too bad for us, but it just turns out because the best strategy for internet platforms to drive engagement in the context of democracy is to play out the politics of hate. If they can render us polarized and ignorant, then we engage more. If they can make us hate the other side, not just as different, but as enemies, we engage more. The politics of hate is the most profitable for them, even if it is wildly unprofitable for us. As Zainab Tufechi puts it, companies are in the business of monetizing attention and not necessarily in ways that are conducive to health or success of social movements or the public sphere. Now we can see this everywhere, but never so clearly as we saw in the extraordinary events of January 6th. In those events where people were rallied from around the country to travel to Washington, D.C. to stop the steal. We saw the manifestation of this infrastructure, not just the Internet, but this infrastructure plus cable television to make people believe what makes the platforms the most money. Now, the point is, these people on January 6th were not all crazy people. There were some, many, who had mental issues but not all. Many of them were people who had just been led to believe, to believe that the world had conspired against them because the platforms had convinced them as much. Now, many people think it's just, you know, the uneducated, but as the Washington Post reported immediately after the January 6th events, over 70% of Republicans said they agreed with President Trump's contention that he received more votes than Joe Biden. Nor was this belief limited to those with lower levels of education. A majority of Republicans with college degrees in our sample said they believed the election results were fraudulent. As they go on, we asked voters whether they thought that, quote, millions of fraudulent mail and absentee ballots were cast and whether, quote, voting machines were manipulated to add tens of thousands of votes for Joe Biden. Finally, we asked respondents reactions to the statements that, quote, thousands of votes were recorded for dead people. For each of these false statements, because, of course, those three statements are absolutely without any basis in fact or evidence. So for these three false statements, more than 50% of Republican respondents said that it was very accurate. Over 75% of Republican voters said that each one was very accurate or somewhat accurate. Only about 3% of Democrats assessed these conspiratorial statements as very accurate. This is the product of a media infrastructure that places us into bubbles and speaks to us differently, acoustically separated bubbles, speaks to us in ways that feed what we want to believe rather than what's true. And that feeding has an effect as we see so many believe what we all can see just is not true. The consequence is a business model that profits from harming us, from harming our democracy, 
because what pays them weakens us. And it even weakens them. Extraordinary Facebook files revealed last year by Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, told a story of an extraordinary company, Facebook, a company that had fundamental values that were at the center of its business, values of privacy and integrity and safety. And more importantly, it had an extraordinary range of engineers, decent, honest people committed to these values, engineers who did everything they could to get the business to support and strengthen and defend these values. And they had plans, they had ideas, they had ways to make sure that the platform would be conducive to a healthy democracy, not constructive of the craziness that we saw. But what those engineers saw in the conflict between their recommendations to support privacy and integrity and safety was a business model that eroded those values because it was inconsistent with the fundamental commitment of that platform to drive engagement, to drive profit. Now, this is inevitable, we need to understand, especially in the age of AI. And think about an idea of instrumental rationality, the extent to which some entity or group is capable of being rational to some end, some particular end. And if you think across time and across the range of instrumental rationality, we can recognize that we humans have had a pretty good run for a long time. We're, we're better at having and engaging instrumental rationality than cows, for example. I mean, maybe not ants and bees, but cows or sheep or um, maybe uh, even, um, well, not rats, but you know, you pick your animals that you think we uh, actually are better at than they. But we need to recognize that corporations are better instrumental rational actors than we are. They can focus on their objective and achieve it more consistently, more reliably than we humans can. And even better than the corporations are the artificial intelligence infrastructures that get built into the corporations and into our lives. Now, each of these instrumentally rational actors purports or tries to control the one that's above them. We try through democracy to control corporations. We believe that our government has the rights and the capacity to control the corporations. And the corporations believe that through their management, they have the capacity to control AI. They think that they can set objectives, objectives of maximizing income subject to the need to be safe or healthy or maintain the integrity of information that they spread. But what we're seeing increasingly is a very different reality of control. Increasingly, it's AI that is controlling the corporations as we saw with Facebook, or with a particular example in 2017 from Facebook, where it was revealed that Facebook's ads uh, were offering a category of Jew haters because the AI had developed Jew haters as a potentially profitable category. Now, of course, there was no human at Facebook that picked the category Jew haters. No human would, but the AI did because that was just what was maximizing its value and the corporation, which had set up the management infrastructure to direct the AI, failed to control this particular innovation of the AI. Or corporations, of course, increasingly control us humans. This is a picture of super PAC spending, which has exploded since Citizens United and more importantly, the DC Circuit case of speech now making it possible for unbelievable amounts of money to be concentrated in the hands of very few. In the last election cycle, the 10 largest super PACs spent more than half of the super PAC money that was spent. And the super PAC money has become the dominant form of spending in the context of political elections. This is a way for those with that money, primarily those with corporate interests, to leverage that power to control us. So in these three models of instrumental rationality, increasingly we should recognize it's the AI 
that will dominate all of them. And that in this dance for the corporations to regulate or control or condition the AI, we should see that the AI's signal that this is the way to maximize what you told me to maximize will increasingly dominate. So if in 2000, the lesson was code is law, I think in 2022, we should recognize business model is law. This is the slogan that should be our focus. Okay, so what's the relevance of this to Wikipedia? I think it's critically relevant because of course, Wikipedia has a business model, but Wikipedia's business model is different from Facebook's. Because of core choices by the founders, Wikipedia was grounded in an anti-advertising context. The commitment not to sell ads was fundamental and incredibly important. Because what this means is that the core norms of Wikipedia, that it be free, that it be neutral, that it be well-sourced, would not be resisted or overridden by the consequences of an AI-driven focus on maximizing advertising revenues, but could be supported because the infrastructure of that business model would support these values. There was no systematic AI-driven force against these values because you can afford to speak the truth in the context of the Wikipedia ecology because falsehood is not more profitable. This is a business model. It's a business model that protects norms. And those norms we protect because we need to protect to derive the most extraordinary innovation on the internet, in my view, which is the ecology of Wikipedia. Now, this example, I think, is critically important and not remarked enough. What could it teach, for example, the news? If we think back to the time when the news served a uniting, integrating, and informative role in American society, what uh, people call the broadcast democracy age of American democracy, when people were focused on the same story through a very small number of mediums, the business model of that news was not to maximize on the basis of driving engagement. The business model was simply to inform. But when the business model changed, even in cable television, we could see it change. What those platforms became was something fundamentally different. This is, I think, the scariest graph in American politics. This is a picture of the ideological content of the cable news networks. And what this shows is that circa 2000, Fox and MSNBC and CNN were basically ideologically the same. But over the period since 2000, we've seen a radical divergence as those companies learn that the business model of driving efficient engagement by their users is served best by polarizing and separating their base so that their base becomes committed and driven by the worldview they offer rather than committed or driven by the truth. Or what could the lessons of Wikipedia teach us for democracy? I mean, obviously, the business model for democracy is inherently for candidates to win. But the question we should ask is, at any cost, with micro-targeting unnecessary means? Because, of course, we would have winners in elections without AI-driven micro-targeting or maybe more accurately, AI-driven nano-targeting that can be targeting even different moods you and individual have, let alone people within your household or people within your neighborhood or people within your city or state or demographic. We would have wimmer, winners in democracy without the democracy-destroying culture that this platform is creating. I think the lesson here should be that we need to choose the business model based upon the AI maximizing effect that we can see that business model will produce and avoid the business models with inevitable externalities, with unavoidable externalities that we can see will weaken or harm 
our society. But so far, we haven't done that. So far, we've allowed these infrastructures to develop without any reckoning of what they will do for us and for our nation. I think our challenge is to do something now before it is too late. Because one might question whether it is too late. And at least I increasingly believe it just might be too late. Okay, so let me try to draw the argument of this talk together. Then, back in 2000, when I allowed this book to be summarized with the slogan, Code is Law, what I meant to be saying is that we needed to choose our code, to defend our code, to defend the infrastructure that the internet would be to protect the values we thought important. We needed to choose our code to defend free speech and privacy and the free opportunity for innovation that end-to-end -end or network neutrality established. And that we needed to defend those values maybe by regulating code, but certainly by regulating to assure that the environment of the internet would defend those values. That was the focus then, because the most significant influence that would determine whether those values survived was the influence of code. Now the story is different. Now our focus should be the business model. Now we should say the business model is law, or maybe we should say business model eats law. And like with code, what that means is whether you need to choose the business model, recognizing its AI driven dynamic based on the values it supports and the society that it builds. That must be our commitment, at least if we still can. Thank you for the chance to present this to you, and I'm eager to see the questions or the objections or the resistance or the ideas it might inspire. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Larry, for the presentation and sharing this with us. Um, I believe, Isaac, you are uh, moderating the Q&A, so if you would like to take it from here, please. Sure. Um, I'm just I'm going to actually pass the mic to Jimmy, who asked for a moment. Yeah, just for a second. Th thanks so much, Larry. This is uh, it's great uh, hearing from you and all this. Um, obviously, I agree completely <laughs> with everything you said, and it's interesting to me to think about how much of my thinking was in the early days was influenced by your thinking, and how some of the decisions we made were consciously if a bit vaguely aware of the issues you're talking about. And others I think were just dumb luck uh, that we went down uh, one path instead of another, not realizing the depth of the implications of where it would end us up. And the, just the one thing I wanted to, to note, and I'm just gonna, uh, you know, it's just a comment really, on some of the values that we strongly represent as uh, Wikipedia and the Wikimedia movement, some of them are very much intimately tied to that choice of business model. So we've always been uh, very, very principled about freedom of expression. We don't bow to government demands to warp the truth that's in Wikipedia. And one of the reasons is we don't have these sort of very hard internal conversations that I assume people like Twitter or Facebook must have if they want to uh, sort of support freedom of expression, but they say, well, we're gonna get blocked in Turkey if this happens. Uh, we don't think, oh, we might get blocked in Turkey, so we better modify Wikipedia to suit the government there. We, we actually think if we stand up for it, our donors are gonna be really happy with us. Our community is gonna be really happy with us. Our business model actually incentivizes us to take a principled approach to these things rather than a page view based approach. So anyway, fantastic talk. Uh, I'm gonna let Thank others you. ask questions. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so the, the first question is, um, what do you think about the data for good initiative for Facebook? And I guess I would make that a little bit broader, that larger data for good movement. Well, I mean, what I found um, most surprising in the Facebook um, 
files. I had the privilege of representing Frances Haugen for the very beginning of that fight that she was having to defend the um, ability to release that information was the depth of goodness inside of the company itself, the, the engineers and the character of the engineers. Um, and the number of exchanges um, that those uh, Facebook files reveal where engineers are pushing hard to do the right thing and then get overridden by management, basically Zuckerberg or other similar sorts was, in, was really inspiring. So I don't doubt the good faith or the good intent of movements like that. Um, what I am skeptical of is that they can survive unless they've been insulated from the dynamics of the business model. So I wanna hear that before I say whether I think it's, um, it's gonna be effective or not. I wanna know exactly how they are insulated. What is the way in which they're not gonna worry? Um, and, uh, and if that's, it's not like they couldn't do it, um, but until that's clear, I, I think we should remain skeptical. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Srijan. Srijan, would you like to ask yourself or shall I go? Uh, sure, I can ask. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Larry, for your talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'll ask one and then give chance to others. Uh, what are your thoughts on the arms race that's there between the malicious actors on social platforms that are trying to spread hate, propaganda, and all the bad things that you talked about? So these bad actors and the detection systems that these platforms have that are trying to catch them. Right? There's this arms race. Uh, and wanted to uh, hear your thoughts on that and the role and responsibility that you feel that these platforms should have or have uh, in, in terms of uh, adapting to these scenarios or catching them. Yeah, I, um, again, I think uh, the Facebook files and Jonathan H just summarized this really powerfully in an article he published in um, The Atlantic. Um, they reveal that the whole effort to suppress bad content is um, hopeless that it only ever suppresses a tiny, tiny fraction of content that we should be worried about. And only in nations which have um, relatively well-known uh, languages. So, you know, a huge amount of content on Facebook, you know, 90% of Facebook's audience is outside the United States. And a huge amount of that content in the context of the developing nations is in contexts where the platform can't even understand the content, can't even understand the language. Um, and so, the reposting in those contexts is a source of extraordinary hate. And you know, obviously allegations of genocide have been pretty well established in some contexts. So I think that we have to focus not so much at the level of how do we identify the bad content and figure out what to do with it, but how do we undermine the incentive to be spreading the bad content or the structures that make it much easier. So Facebook discovered that if they just turned off the ability to repost automatically after two reposts. So you can't just simply click a button and repost content if it's been reposted twice before, you'd have to copy the URL and post it directly. That it could, it could eliminate an extraordinary amount of uh, misinformation that was on their platform. Simply by slowing the platform down to kind of human speed, you could bring humans into the process of making a better evaluation of whether they should be sharing that content um, I think that's the more effective way to think about addressing these problems rather than imagining some super AI content moderator who's going to be able to figure out the subtle um, meaning of hate in these different environments. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Leila, you're up next. Would you like to ask? Sure. Uh, so, Larry, you talked about business model is law, and I'm thinking about um, the situation of the governments now who are who still believe and see profit in falsehood and how does this focus in on business model is law going to play at the same time that these seemingly very strong governments are also involved in investing more and more in falsehood yeah i mean so when i put this uh, slogan out it's going to cause i'm sure as much confusion as code is law cause. So I, you know, I don't take responsibility for the confusion. Uh, maybe I should. Um, but when I put that out, I don't mean to say that this is the only problem we should be focusing on. Um, it's a particular problem that we should be focusing on right now in a world where antitrust has not yet addressed these extraordinarily powerful dominant platforms. And it's not clear it, it will in the next 10 years. Um, it's still amazing to recognize that the last major antitrust case 
involving the internet, I was involved with. It was the Microsoft case where for a brief moment, a nanosecond, I was a special master in that case. But the idea that that was the last time we had serious antitrust review of these platforms is astonishing. But in addition to the problem caused by the, uh, the dominant power of the platforms, we have to worry about governments and, not, and especially again, governments um, in contexts where violence can be even more effectively delivered. Um, and, and of course, to, the thing to recognize is that is the conjunction of interests between governments and these platforms. I mean, if the governments are using the platforms to spread their hate or to spread their authoritarian um, falsehoods, um, the platforms profit from that too, to the extent that the platforms at least are being compensated to do that. Um, so I think that thing we need to encourage our locations on the internet, we can reliably understand our locations of truth. Again, you know, Wikipedia is kind of unique in that. It is astonishing the number of my colleagues who 10 years ago would have been so skeptical of Wikipedia as a source of anything, but who now are open about the value of Wikipedia in establishing a kind of foundation for understanding and truth. Um, and, you know, I, not that I, I'm eager, you know, I'm not trying to break your monopoly on truth, but I would like a thousand Wikipedia-like locations to be out there where people can believe that they're stepping on something that has a foundation in reality as opposed to something that has foundation in the interest of either a corporation or the political interest of a government. All right, I'll pass on to Bob now if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks, Isaac, and thanks, Larry. I was I was wondering. Um, I wanted to poke your brain about re the concept of recommender systems because that's at the core of a lot of this, right? They they nano optimize to your to people and to the moods of people by the hour and minute and so on. But they also seem a necessity to even deal with all the content that's created all the time, right? So we can't really compare it to the cable news era because they're wasn't this amount of content to be curated. Now it's just, it's just too much. So I'm, I'm wondering to what degree, what are the options we even have? Because sure, we could try to turn off the recommender systems, but then the, everything, would, we couldn't cope anymore. And to what degree are these just baked in consequences that don't need any malice even? They just come with the technical implementation of these systems. And do you think that the challenge needs to shift to actively work to keep the recommender systems usable? But, but where's the line? Where, how can we say this is now bad versus good recommending? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the first thing to recognize is, you know, for most of the history of humanity, we didn't actually have to deal with all information that was out there. <laughs> most of the information that was out there, the comments of people, the fights of your neighbors, all of that was invisible to you. And we got along pretty well. I mean, we could run democracies, you know, Europe, uh, um, uh, in Japan, and uh, in Korea, uh, and in the United States, we could run democracies quite effectively without everybody having access to all information. And now we've turned on the, the fire hose of all information, and now we're kind of trying to figure out how do we deal with it. And the challenge that I'm first identifying is we turned on the fire hose, but with a very poisonous incentive um, for the fire hose to be tweaked to drive engagement against the background of humans who unfortunately for us are turned on more by outrage and hate than are turned on by poetry and, and well thought out uh, arguments. Um, um, you remember, uh, um, well, I don't wanna get this too far as a diversion. Okay, so, so, um, so you're right. I think that even in the best world, we're gonna have structures of recommendation engines. And I think the most we can do is first monitor the incentives of the recommenders. Like, are you a recommender? Like, I don't think there's any problems being like a right-wing recommender or a left-wing recommender or a recommender for like, um, you know, good food or whatever. Um, but you might be concerned when you understand that the recommender has a system of incentives that is driving them away from recommending the best right-wing content as opposed to the right-wing content that's paid for by X or Y. We at least need to understand that. So the structure of incentives is number one. And number two, we have to recognize that, the, that it's a very complex system that we, are, we have implemented and we need lots of data to understand the sensitivity of any of these architectural choices 
to the uh, reality that they produce. So transparency about the data and, um, and, and how it's actually mattering uh, would be extremely important. Of course, the platforms have resisted so far the call of researchers to have access to their data, to be able to make an evaluation of like, you know, what, what is the consequence really of turning on um, the repost um, uh, all the way up to 10 different reposts? Like what is the real consequence for that? Instead, they have to rely on their own researchers. And of course, the consequence of the Facebook files is I'm sure Facebook is gonna do a lot less internal research because they're afraid of like, the, the, those data being revealed to the public. Well. Somebody needs to be doing that research. And I obviously support the idea of making the data accessible to researchers um, who can be making the evaluation so that we can learn which, which architectural choices um, uh, against the background of certain business models are safer than others, because I don't think we know that right now. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Octi. Octi, I'll give you a chance if you want to ask it yourself. Otherwise, I'll proceed. Okay. Hi, yes. Uh, this is Octi. Thanks for the opportunity and, and a great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, also since Jimmy is here, uh, since the, the start of, uh, you know, when, when I started using Wikipedia, I always wondered why you don't have like a tiny box on each Wikipedia article with, with an ad in a very, uh, you know, as harmless as possible way, uh, verified. You know, if, for example, if you listen to NPR, they have these tiny bits of uh, select set of, uh, uh, you know, commercials. And they also, whenever there's the news is about those supporters, they declare it. So I, um, I feel like not an expert in this space, I'm a computer scientist, but I feel like they're, there could be a way in theory to uh, make the business model less harmful. And I was wondering what your thoughts would be. And if the answer to this is yes, it's possible, then wouldn't it be possible to have uh, regulations that every single ad supported uh, social media platform or internet uh, platform should follow these strict regulations so that they don't end up being so harmful? Well, I think that you're pointing to NPR as a really important um, uh, recognition because, I mean, in fact, there have been lots of claims that NPR's acceptance of sponsorship by certain entities like uh, 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 oil companies and the like has affected their reporting, um, that, the, that the managers in the context of deciding um, which things ought to be covered can't help but worry about whether the things they cover might affect their ability to get sponsorship in certain areas. So, you know, even though I think our perception of NPR, at least in the United States, at least among us liberals, is that it's a good site, it's it's also got its integrity or corruption problems. And and you know, I'll let Jimmy speak for Wikipedia, but I would be terrified with the idea of Wikipedia embedding any advertising um, dimension into what they're doing. It's not because it's disruptive to the reader. I mean, of course, you could you could frame it so it's just a tiny little box to the side. But the question is, like, you know, as the middle managers of Wikipedia are trying to figure out how to maximize um, revenue for advertising, what decisions do they make? What kind of recommendation decisions do they make? Or when they tell the AI that you know you might develop inside of Wikipedia, here's one of our maximizing dimensions. What does the AI do? I mean, I think all of those are very difficult choices to do and to get right. Um, but then the third point is, let's imagine you came up with the best possible structure of, record, of, of uh, integrity for advertising. Why not just impose it on all other um, sites? Well, I do think we need to think about regulating um, targeted advertising in certain contexts of other platforms. Um, but in the United States, that's gonna be extremely difficult because the, um, uh, First Amendment has been raised as an absolute bar to this kind of regulation. A decade ago, my friend Eugene Volokh um, was hired by Google to write a paper that basically said algorithms are speech. And so therefore you can't regulate algorithms. You can't muck about with that at all because that's core political speech. I, I think the argument's crazy, but if you asked, you know, what's the stand of courts today, most courts would take something closer to Eugene's view than to my view. Um, and, and so I think the United States, we're gonna see a lot of constitutional limitations to the ability of the government to deal with these questions. 
Um, you know, I, I've been saying we ought to be regulating the business model. People say there's a constitutional right to your business model. I think that's crazy, but you know, I think a lot of things are crazy and the courts seem to think differently. Um, but I think that there is a chance in Europe in particular, which has, um, which has taken a lot of aggressive steps. Again, I think pushed by the Facebook files um, to experiment with different kinds of regulations. And I'm hopeful that if Europe trips on the right kind of regulations that minimize the uh, poison, at least in the context of democracy speech, um, that other countries will find a way to integrate it into their own regulations, uh, the First Amendment notwithstanding. Thank you, Sam. Jimmy, if you're still here, did you want to make a response as well? All right, I will go on to the next question then. It's coming from Matt. Um, and he asks, are you able to speak to Wikidata's use of CC0 licenses and the commercial appropriation of CC0 licensed metadata and applications such as Google Knowledge Graph? Um, I, I'm a little bit hesitant because I don't know the facts well enough. Um, my own view is, um, you know, data is a complicated licensing space because of the difference between the Europeans and the Americans about whether the underlying resource can be licensed at all. And my own, my own view is very uh, libertarian about it. We, we ought to be enabling as much data to be usable as possible. And to the extent there are privacy concerns, we should not be looking to copyright law or licenses to be dealing with the privacy concerns. I, I think there is an essential need for privacy regulation and essential need for data misuse regulation. Um, but that's it. But that, in my view, is just independent of this crude hammer of copyrights. So, my general bias is in favor of CC zero for as much as possible. Um, and uh, and you know, if it helps commercial entities do commercial things, then I think that's you know, in a Richard Stallman sense, that's that's what free that's what freedom means. Thank you, Pablo. You're up next. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, thanks, Isaac. Uh, thanks. Uh, for the talk. So uh, speaking of business model, uh, could a different form of monetizing the internet, and when I say by monetizing, I mean quantifying value, like that value that will be maximized by artificial intelligence or by a recommended system, uh, a way of quantifying value rather than clicking behavior that is not based on creating clicks, but in a more sophisticated forms of value could have a positive impact on the dynamics of web platforms? Well, I think that, you know, there's been a long tradition of trying to think of these alternative structures. I think Corey, Dr. Rose, Woofie, um, uh, early on was like imagining a way of rewarding uh, behavior um, that wouldn't be directed, wouldn't be linked to something like clicking. And, and I think what we ought to be committed to is the idea of experimenting with lots of different um, uh, ways to try to do that, to monetize and to, and to, and to uh, recognize support for this infrastructure. We should also be open to a very traditional answer, which is, um, you know, public support for infrastructures, um, which, you know, the nature of public support for infrastructures, at least ideally, obviously governments are not always good at this, but is to remove the support from the question of the corruption of the integrity of the platform. Um, and so I would be in favor of trying all of these and looking for all of these, but in a world where we have transparency, to understand how, in fact, these different regimes are affecting behavior and the spread of the spread of information. Daniela, you're up next. Would you like to ask? Oh yes, thank you. Uh, sorry for the noise. There is a storm outside, but uh, so I wanted to ask uh, um, the market and the law as you said, uh, are powerful forces uh, that are able to profoundly influence uh, the evolution of the internet, uh, and sometimes in good ways, uh, for example, by financing some uh, innovative technologies uh, uh, or protecting the rights of the users, uh, uh, but sometimes in bad ways. Um, so projects that Wikipedia and Wikidata uh, Show that it is possible to have a uh, of self-regulation uh, where we also have the community as a very powerful force that is able to uh, in some way uh, interface with the other forces and uh, uh, understand itself uh, uh, um, 
by itself to uh, to drive uh, to drive its own destiny. Uh, uh, so I wanted to ask, in your opinion, uh, um, what is the best way to support uh, uh, and incentivize such a model where the uh, and how can we make sure that uh, such model uh, can survive and can thrive in the current environment? Yeah, um, I think it's an, incre it's an incredibly important um, resource uh, to, to deploy and to rely on. But we need to be constantly skeptical about the quote, I mean, the content of the quote community, because sometimes communities can become themselves corrupted so that interested parties populate the community with um, you know, quote, community members who then affect the force of those interested parties as opposed to just the community. So I think that as long as that dimension of awareness is there, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a very valuable thing to add. Um, so I apologize. Um, I thought we were going to quarter after, and I've got a cab outside uh, honking. You might've just heard the honking. Um, so I have to flee. Um, uh, no worries. Thank you so much, Larry. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks, Larry. Although he's not here anymore, that was an amazing talk and a very engaging session, I think. So um, it's already time to wrap up the event. Um, hard to believe. Um, do we have the slides, uh, Leila? Can you share your screen, maybe? Sorry, I'm working on it. No, it should be OK now. Great. OK, thank you. Sorry, just one second for me to be cool. So I think the I can already announce the next slide. You will see the map, right? You will see the map on which you put your little red stars during the breakout, the ice breakout session. Um, we see that we have quite a big spread of where people are from, but we also still have a lot of white spots um, on this map. So let's work together to fill up this map for the future and tell all your friends, um, you know, I guess, especially if they're from Canada or Russia or Brazil, big places from which we have no speakers. So we still have way to go, but overall amazing diversity already. By the way, what I found funny is that uh, you see some of the stars are sl slightly rotated. I think someone rotated by mistake after copying and then people copied that. So we have a nice way of basically figuring out, um, it's nearly like doing genetics here, who copied from whom. Um, great, um, thanks. Uh, Leila, can you please advance the slide? Um, thanks also to all the uh, PC members who helped us put together this, um, this program, as was mentioned by Leila and uh, by, by Miriam and Srijan, we had a record number of submissions and dealing with them is only possible because of this amazing uh, program committee that we had. My assessment is that the reviews that were written by this set of re reviewers for the workshop were by far much better, more useful, more informative than the average review that you get at a, a typical computer science conference. And this is possible because we moved really to a wiki model, 31 submissions, 37 reviewers. So there, you, your papers, when you submit them to the workshop, actually get a lot, a, lot of, a lot of love and attention. In the first edition of the wiki, in the first editions actually of the wiki workshop, we had only the three organizers who did all the reviewing. And uh, this amazing quality of reviews that we have now is only possible because we moved from three to 37 reviewers. So thanks very much again to all the reviewers who spent their, their time in, uh, in uh, assuring this, the, the quality of what was presented here. I think you noticed in the presentations that this is really good work. Um, this also applies to the entire uh, event, the, the fact that this only works because we work in a, in a wiki model. Um, all the, the set of people who are involved in making this event success is much, much bigger than the set of the smallish set of people that you see listed, for example, on the website. So we have the, of course, the invited speakers who, um, who make this event a success. So thanks again 
to Larry and, and to Eric who moderated the panel, to Michi, uh, Tiffany and Corey who were on the panel. Thanks for, for the live music from, from Ugne. I think this is really such a nice twist to the workshop. Thanks to MC, uh, MC Ready uh, or DJ Miriam for putting on music uh, in, in the breaks and so on. Thanks to all the authors. This is really the, the meat of the workshop. I apologize to the vegetarians. It's, let's say, it's the potatoes of the workshop, the thing that nourishes us. Thanks to all the session volunteers who, um, who made sure that everything ran smoothly, not only in the main room, but also everywhere else. Thanks to Benjamin uh, Mako Hill, uh, who worked really, really tirelessly with Leila. I mean, I think this is just amazing to review 230 papers uh, to sift out these two excellent uh, ones that we saw nominated for the reward. Thanks also for Jimmy Wales uh, for popping in. It was great to see uh, Jimmy, Jimmy's impromptu appearance also in uh, the beginning of, of Larry Lessig's talk. So this is um, really nice, I think, to see, to see this momentum. And, um, and thanks to everyone else also who I forget. It's, uh, it's really just so amazing to see that, uh, that this workshop works. And it's, it's in that spirit of what it's about, Wikipedia working together um, as, a, as a group of people to make something happen. So this is the second to last slide. This is just ways of staying in touch even once we all click leave, the leave button um, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Wiki Workshop is um, kind of our, uh, maybe a flagship event of the year, but there are many other opportunities for staying in touch um, among, uh, um, in, in, as the community for connecting with other researchers, both at Wikimedia, but also much beyond. Um, Jimmy mentioned it in his talk when he gave the award to the, to the WIT paper, the first one that um, was mentioned. Um, if you're attending ICLR, a machine learning conference, then please do not miss the Wiki M3L workshop. So that's Wikipedia and multimodal and multilingual research. Both researchers and non-researchers are welcome to attend that um, event. Um, then another way of staying in touch is via the uh, public mailing list, Wikipedia research. You have, uh, you have a link here. Then there are monthly public office hours. Uh, it's, an, it's a great opportunity to basically get hands-on advice and input on your research ideas, research problems um, directly from the mothership, if you will. And uh, then also there are monthly research showcases where every, every month um, you see two talks about ongoing research in the Wikimedia world um, from invited uh, speakers, mostly from outside the Wikimedia Foundation, actually. Um, and then finally, you, you have some other social media channels here, um, old school and new school, there's IRC, that's the old school, and uh, Twitter, that's the new school. And of course, we will see you next year for what it will actually be the 10th Wiki Workshop. Hard to believe, but it's actually true. It will be, uh, it won't be quite a decade yet because there was a year or two where we had two workshops in one year. So I think it will be the eighth year, but it will be the 10th workshop. And if I had Miriam's music playing abilities, I would now play this song um, called 10 years, but I encourage you all to just wiki it afterwards and it's quite entertaining. So with that, from my side, that's it. Thanks again for attending. It's really, um, you attending is what makes this workshop work. So thanks a lot, it's, uh, it's been an amazing time.